Okay, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb, uh, what number is it? 42, 43, 44? 40, oh, is that better? There. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, welcome to the PerfWeb program. We've got a heck of a show for you today. Let's just get through it, okay? Let's thank our sponsors, Levanova, Siemens, and a new sponsor, which is Houston Extracorporeal Technologies. So if you happen to be, and by the way, these sponsors, hugely important to us. So please go online, check out their sites, give them a call, let your sales reps know that you watch the program. It's really important for us to have their support. And that's how they, of course, judge whether or not they want to continue giving us support. So please do that for us. Houston Extracorporeal Technologies is hiring. So if you are interested in working for Notwithstanding, we do have some wonderful folks here from a different perfusion department, which we will describe here in a little bit. Um, best company you could ever work for in a non-academic private practice setting. So if you're looking for a place to really practice your trade where you're valued, you enjoy your job, great group of people, please go to the website, het.us, check us out. You can uh, apply right through there. We're also looking for qualified auto transfusionists as well. And we will be starting our Nurse ECMO Specialist Program, which if you're a nurse out there watching this program, please take a look at that as well. Uh, social media, we are on the Facebook, the Twitter, the YouTube, and the LinkedIn. Just go to those sites. You can follow us. You can like us, follow us, share us. Make sure you give us the thumbs up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we have websites you can go to for your educational uh, needs. We have uh, perfweb.us and perfusioneducation.com. Uh, great opportunity for you to get your ABCP required uh, meeting points that you can't get from live meetings now because obviously live meetings have not yet uh, started back. I don't know when they're going to. I think uh, Dr. Samir may actually have some insight into that with his presentation today on an update in COVID-19. So something we actually added to the program. I think you're gonna really enjoy that. We have a call-in number. When you see this symbol, the phone lines are open. If you'd like to be live on the air, please don't hesitate to call that number. And uh, we will be uh, able to answer the phone and you can ask your question of any of the panelists. And then of course, I also wanna to talk to you about our uh, MediWeb app. Uh, so we have two apps, but I'm going to specifically just tell you about the MediWeb Critical Care app. It has a perfusion section. It has an ECMO section, a hemodynamic section, conversion section, uh, nomogram section. And we're just going to scroll through this. You probably saw there was a QR code there. But if you go to any of our websites, if you go to perfusion, uh, perfweb.us or perfusioneducation.com, and you can click on the uh, mobile app, you can find us on the App Store. You can find us on Google Play. The app is readily available. And uh, I think that it's very good for any perfusionist, of course, any ECMO specialist, and critical care nurses as well, because it does have a very nice IV uh, and infusion rate calculator that I think you'll find unique and not something that's available in other, uh, other apps that may exist. So there you go. I think I've covered everything there. I'd like to introduce you to what is going to be a wonderful panel today. Uh, immediately to my right, I think you've all met him once before, is Dr. Soma Joythula. He is a pulmonary and critical care medicine physician at uh, the Advanced Heart Failure Memorial Herman Texas Medical Center. Uh, you uh, have been practicing since uh, critical care medicine since 2006. You really are uh, very, very, very um, involved in lung transplantation, interstitial lung disease, COPD, pulmonary hypertension, and interventional pulmonology, which is excellent. Uh, you, your practice philosophy is to provide the highest quality of comp and comprehensive innovative care to your patients with chronic lung disease. And of course, since we have gone through all of what we've gone through here with COVID, I think you're going to have some interesting perspectives on the pro-con of proning patients, specifically proning ECMO patients, uh, patients who are already on ECMO that may have COVID-19 and some type of, you know, a, a 
some type of ARDS COVID related. So we're looking forward to that. But Dr. Soma, thank you for being here again on the Saturday and taking your time. It's great to see you. We call him Dr. Soma versus Dr. Joy Thula because it is a little easier to say, but I practiced his name all night last night to make sure that I could say it properly. I just hope I did say it properly. Almost. Almost. <laughs> close enough. Close enough for government work. And don't forget, you're also a poet. We, we you did some of your poetry the last time you were here, and it was beautiful. So I'd like to get a follow-up at the end of the program about how you're doing with that. Um, you Thank you. Immediately to Dr. Soma's right is the, is the, 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 I don't even know what word I could use. The, the, irreplaceable, the, the, the god of all ECMO, the incredible Dr. Haney Samir. You are the, you are uh, at Texas, uh, Houston Methodist, Texas Medical Center. You're an anesthesiologist and critical care doc. You specialize in transplants. You specialize in ECMO. You specialize in telemedicine. In fact, I think that's one of your new, uh, your new passions in life. You also have done a tremendous amount of work in this COVID pandemic, understanding what is happening to these patients and how best to manage them. Uh, you're also, uh, you also, you just have a lot of experience. You have 33 years at least of experience in, uh, in, in major surgery, critical uh, 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 anesthesiology, critical care medicine, cardiovascular medicine, uh, emergency medicine, and managing these patients, not just intraoperatively, but postoperatively. So once again, Dr. Samir, as always, it's a pleasure to have you here. We love you. We appreciate you. And we and I I personally bow to your greatness all the time. <laughs> We're humbled right now. We're I, I, yes. shy. Immediately next to uh, Dr. Samir is John Ingram. John is a uh, magna cum laude graduate from the University of Texas. He did his perfusion training at the Texas uh, Art Institute. You have several patents. He served as a consultant for uh, basically every uh, uh, perfusion manufacturer there are. You've published several research projects that, that were uh, specific to you, um, uh, novel, and thank you. Here, can I take that, it off that, this thing? That's my thing. Thank you. That mic is like that. And you have at least 15 years of experience as a chief, but basically over 30 years now of experience in perfusion. You are currently working predominantly in Orlando, but with this pandemic, you have traveled to a whole variety of different places uh, in order to uh, help out in the pandemic, managing ECMO patients in hospitals all the way from the East Coast all the way to California and the West Coast and places in between. So, you're a stalwart uh, supporter of the program. Thank you very much for being here again on a Saturday, traveling from Orlando. We appreciate you. Gil Ford, first time that Gil has been here. Gil Ford II is the chief perfusionist at Houston Methodist Hospital. He's worked for Houston Methodist now for six years and was recently named the chief. So congratulations on that, Gil. You graduated from the Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion Technology in 2012. And so you became chief of a huge program in a very short period of time. I think that speaks volumes to your capabilities. After graduating from THI, you also worked at Duke University. You know, I worked at Duke. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you knew that. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Did you know, you know, Ian, Ian was there when I you knew, were there? Knew Ian, he was my chief. Yeah, Ian, yeah. Ian and I go back a long way, we really do. Uh, but you were there for two years uh, before returning to Houston to go to stay at Methodist and again, really grow your uh, your professional uh, career, I think very well there. And I'm, I just can only say that I'm very proud of the fact that you became the chief. I think you're gonna do great things for that program. Thank you. And then immediately to the end, wearing the red pants. I'm gonna put you on the end, Serena, because you have really nice, colorful pants. Okay? Thank you. Serena, Patrick is an RN, a BSN, a CCTC. What is a CCTC? I don't know. <laughs> that is a certified clinical transplant coordinator. Copy. So, and you happen to be a lung transplant coordinator, yes. uh, I wonder why, <laughs> at Methodist Hospital, Houston, Texas, Texas Medical Center. And you help to evaluate patients for transplant. You're involved in their transplant care before surgery and long-term follow-up. 
Your role ensures that all aspects of patient information are available to the physicians and to the patients in order to make good decisions. You obtained your bachelor's uh, degree in nursing from Prairie View A&M University and currently working on your master's degree in nursing education. Excellent with that uh, at Aspen University. You have 10 years of nursing experience with a background predominantly in critical care, employed in various neuro, medical, and trauma ICUs during your career. Serena has been working with patients who require lung transplants for the past five years and as a member of the International Transplant Nurse Society. Really, that's, that's very impressive. She is certified clinical transplant coordinator, has been a mentor and preceptor to upcoming and fellow nurses. Often recognized by her past patients for her dedication to what she does, Serena aims to tie her nursing experience with her passion for patient safety and nursing education. She is originally from DuPont, Washington, the left coast. Uh, And, um, (laughs) yep, not DuPont, Washington, D.C., DuPont, Washington, left coast. Yes. But has decided to make Houston her home due to your aspirations to continue to work in the world-renowned Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. Yes, number two and number three are still not as big as TMC. Correct. TMC is by far the largest. And if you've never been down there, I highly recommend to anyone, take a trip to Houston, <laughs> drive to the Texas Medical Center. It, it is bigger than most cities yes. in this country, other than maybe Los Angeles and New York and Chicago. Right. But it's huge, enormous place. So that is our esteemed panel. That was a whole lot. Now, I have to do one quick shout out, if I may. Um, I would like to thank uh, my dear friend, Super Porn, or Cuffly Super Porn, otherwise known as Tabby, and Nakchana Klangsuk. It's very difficult to say these names. They're Thai, uh, but fusionist. She is the president of the Society of Cardiothoracic Technologists of Thailand. I recently did a presentation for them, uh, two presentations actually, and I would like to thank them very much for their gracious uh, Thai, which is made handmade of Thai silk, a Thai, uh, Thai, a Thai silk tie, <laughs> and uh, this is from the. Uh, Chulaborn International College of Medicine. So it has its symbol right there. And I w- I'm wearing it proudly today and will wear it proudly for many years to come. So I want to thank you all very much for sending that to me. Okay, we're going off schedule a little bit. I'm going to start right off with Dr. Haney Samir giving up. Oh, is that what we're doing? Are we doing the update on COVID or are we doing the pro-con? Which are we doing? The pro-con. Okay, so we're going to do uh, proning for COVID-associated ARDS or proning in general or proning for patients on ECMO or whatever direction they're going to take this. And Dr. Samir is taking the pro-proning position. Dr. Joythula or Dr. Soma is taking the con-proning position. So I'm glad you were willing to do that, Dr. Soma. I'm not sure how you really feel, but I hope (laughs) we will find out. And so with that, Dr. Samir. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for having me here. And I'm here among friends. Like I told Joe, my crew is here, so I'm very happy today. A lot of friends here today. And I wanna, I wanna show you how crazy I am. I'm gonna say hi to my friends at Hanover Rise Village Pool. They're watching the program as we speak right now. So we're gonna talk about proning and COVID-19. Okay, and I'm gonna be honest right now. I, I was, I'm taking the pro because it's easy. It's the hip thing right now. Okay, I'm before, okay, proning was not my thing at all. But when I saw what it does for patients, now it's becoming my thing. And I have to say, uh, you know, you're gonna have to combine a prone, both other volume, uh, uh, neuromuscular blockade, and you have to choose your patients uh, early. When you think of proning, just do it, okay? Do not ponder it. And there's some recommendations about selecting your patients. I don't think there's any uh, patient selection. You should prone everybody you think about proning. And it's easy for me to say go prone, we have an amazing proning team. And we'll talk about that in the next slide, maybe. I'll tell you, the proning team, uh, we thought they're gonna be specialists, but we have people that stepped up, and I'm not kidding, dietary, physical therapy, security, okay? Everybody who felt they can do that, they did it, they, they made the amazing proning team, led the, the director of our physical therapy program, and I have to tell you something, they did an amazing job. 
they remember everybody here, they have to gown up, down and off. They have to protect themselves and get in the room. And it does not matter what the patient physiological status is. They're going by the physician recommendation. Please prone this patient. They go ahead and prone the patient. And I'll tell you, I feel bad for them sometimes because they're doing this under trying conditions. One thing, we have to support them and assure them that we'll give them a clinical backup. Something's going to happen. You're going to prone, patient's going to decompensate. You have to be ready to flip them right away. These guys just know that. They know when I say flip back, they have to flip back right away. And I'll tell you, it is an amazing team. I'm really proud to work with them. They humble me every time I, I'm just giving an order. Uh, go prone the patient. They have to, five of them have to go in the room, prone the patient, regardless of the size of the patient, regardless of the situation, and they go ahead and do it. Because they know they're helping a lot. They're saving lives. And, you know, I'll tell you what I'm going to ask some of this. Do you feel there's a minimum time or a maximum time for a proning? Um, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you something. I, 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 I have a feeling we're going to agree more than five anyway. So I'll tell you something. I put prone and prone for as long as you can, as long as you're maintaining hemodynamics, oxygen is improving. And you really have to keep, uh, like, get ABG serious and see what's happening. We had a patient. It was interesting for me. We, we prone her. She becomes, uh, her hypoxia improves. She becomes hypercarbic. We have to flip her back. So we go back, we go back and forth. I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, it is, again, I think I wasn't believing in the past. And there's uh, SCCM, chest, everything I published. You know, proning does improve oxygenation, but does it improve outcome. But with COVID-19, it's an improving outcome. Why is that the case? I have no idea. Probably because we had nothing else to offer in the beginning. And now we're going to go to, uh, you know, I, again, I believe every patient is a candidate, okay? Initiate very early, do not hesitate. Now, what are we going to do with, uh, now, Joe puts a picture on ECMO. Should we prone or not? It's a big controversy. ECMO cannulas, it's a big drama. And I'll tell you something, Joe and Gil, I'm going to put, uh, you know, you know that the drama that happens with moving patients with ECMO. And unless you're being very careful, you have perfusions in the room, don't do it. So if you're going to prone somebody, you have to have, that is a mandatory for me. Doesn't matter if it doesn't be in the team, a perfusion has to be in the room. And the perfusion is assigned to maintain those cannulas in place. They know what the cannulas need to be and how the tubing doesn't kink. So if you don't have your perfusion in the, in the room, do not prone the patient. And I do believe prone with perfusion, and I really, I have to tell you, the outcomes have been amazing. And I say, leave them as long as you can, and, and don't flip them back. And then if you flip them back, what should you prone them again? If they decompensate, prone them again. So again, I think ECMO and proning have the same thing in common. I mean, early intervention. You think about it, just do it, okay? Unlike ECMO, I mean, I feel proning, there's everybody's a candidate. And there's some hospitals that have weight limitation. And I'll tell you, it's one of the other hospitals I work with. They told me, okay, not prone this patient, but they were very aggressive. The next day, I wrote a prone bed. And by the way, most of our proning is happening with regular beds. Maybe I should not have, I should have said that in the beginning. Not with the rota prone. The rota prone is an amazing bed. Put the patient, flip the button, the bed slowly moves. But it's, that's not, that's expensive, not available to every hospital. So any hospital that has a rota prone pre bed, they have to rent it out. So I'll tell you, I mean, the hospital told me the patient is too oversized for us to turn him. They had a rotor prone and worked out for the patient very well. And I, I, right now, I'll tell you, even patients, which I'm sure you told us some patients that are not in the hospital, uh, they're, they're at home. I had two patients at home asked me to manage them. So I told them, I'll make a deal with you. I'll manage you, but you have to listen to me. Every morning, temp check, pulse oximeter check, and you're going to sleep on your stomach for the whole night. Those two patients slept on their stomach with no problem. And they have to tell you, they recovered from COVID-19 with no issues. So what's the whole story with COVID-19 recovery with proning? I do not know the answer is. There's so many things that are evolving. We'll talk about it later. But I can tell you something. Those patients stayed at home, did not require any hospitalization. And people who self-prone, I tell you, I admire them. I cannot self-prone. So any patient who self-prone, I admire them. And they listen. And, they, and I find that the patients that don't listen, they end up being intubated. And I'll tell you, so for proning, like we were talking before, I like those numbers. Those are, those are very good numbers, and we keep those numbers in mind. You have four people to prone, one to hold on to the ET tube, one to hold on to the cannulas. Gilly, I agree or disagree? Uh, I would agree, I would agree, but I would also say it's dependent on where your cannulation site is. Because from a perfusion standpoint, we also want to make sure that we can visualize the cannulas at all times in the insertion site. So femoral cannulation, I wouldn't advise prony, but IJ, we can control that. Um, so at, in, at no point would we lose uh, uh, 
would there be a possibility of, I mean, there's always a possibility of decannulation, there's but always in that situation, that we can actually, we have better control of that situation. So what do you think if you, you want to, you want to, there was ephemeral, you want to do half prone, like lift on the side maybe? Oh, yeah, half prone, half prone on the side would work for femoral cannulation because again, we can still visualize the, we can still visualize the insertion site. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to be very honest with everyone. Like Gil said, have the cannulus dislodged? Yes. <laughs> and if anybody's seen an ECMO cannula dislodged, it's like a snake. I mean, the, it's the pump is going, the cannula is all over the place. Looks like somebody got shot in the room. Blood all over the walls. And so that is a very unpleasant situation. Well, it could go the other way. That could go the other way. If you pull the access out, you fill the circuit full of air. Yeah. So it, it doesn't make a big mess, but it certainly results in the same outcome. I, mean, I really have to tell you, you have to be very careful, but I think there we need somebody to hold it. Somebody holds on to the ET tube when you're turning the patient. And that's, I always look at luck, make sure that's happening. And somebody holding on to the ECMO cannulus. But I'll tell you, we moved VADs. Gil knows how obsessed I am. Moving VADs from the bed to the, to the, from the OR bed to the ICU bed. Somebody has to be holding on to all uh, in and out. And same with the cannulus. If you hold on to the cannulus, somebody outside watching the tubing and calls it. If the tubing is getting caught in something, you know, you need to just stop what's happening. And everybody needs to listen. Stop talking. You know, that's, it's not a time to socialize. Mm -hmm. Not a time to Facebook. Mm -hmm. so, I, uh, so I'll tell you. That may I interrupt you just one second? Yeah. I don't mean to. Uh, please forgive me. But Gil, in regards to this and also Dr. Smear, anyone else in the panel, if you put the cannulas in, I mean, to avoid accidental unintended decannulation, how about let's make sure they're very secured. Right. Sewn in appropriately dressed with, you know, safety mechanisms in place. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to add that in. I'll tell you, nothing, nothing beats the a perfusion's hold on to the canis. Nothing beats that. And somebody watching that canis. Because you and I have seen them in the sludge a hundred times. Or a, competent, or a competent nurse ECMO specialist. I don't think you say perfusionist, but again, I think that well, it, during the it move does time, not Joe, actually have to During be the move and time, I'm sorry, I disagree hundred percent. There has to be a perfusion in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can yeah. argue later. I'm going to be on Dr. Soma's <laughs> side. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I would ask the provisions to be in the room when these kind of shenanigans are happening. I, I mean, really, because they have to rescue the situation. And they, that's their specialty, to handle the rescue situation. I don't want to be looking around for Gil or anybody else when these situations are happening. So I'll tell you, that I'm very obsessed with that. Yeah, and I would, I would agree with you on that point, point as well. The ECMO, the, ECMO the ECMO specialists, Steve, sir. ECMO specialists are great. ECMO specialists are great, but... If, it, if there were an accidental decannulation or anything of that nature, you want, you want to actually have somebody who can be there and actually manage the situation. Perfusion is limited in what they can do in response to that. We stop the circuit, uh, get the surgeon there so he can recannulate and all. Uh, but to your point, Joe, if that, air, if that circuit becomes entrained with air, if we can recover that circuit, it's going to be the perfusionist who has to, who has to be there to actually do that. Absolutely or somebody to evaluate and say, hey, we just got to change this circuit out. We're not going to be able to get all this out. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'll tell you something, our perfusion is so amazing. When you ask them to do, be in the room, that's happening. They understand the danger of the situation and they're there the whole time. And I'll tell you, when I watched it, they're holding onto the canyons, obsessed with it. It's an amazing situation. Mm -hmm. It's I, really a, mm -hmm. a symphony working together. I certainly understand that and I respect your position about this, but I'm just going to say this. If the, I think, I think again, I think perfusionists, and I'm not trying to say that perfusionists aren't really good at what we do. It's just that we can discuss this later as to why I have this philosophy. However, again, anyone who understands the consequences of an unintended acute decannulation is going to be very careful with those lines. Number one. Number two, if you have a patient who is ECMO dependent, of which most of these people are, and you have an acute unintended decannulation from the access side or the return side, the outcome is predetermined. It doesn't matter who's standing there at all. So I think that that's I think that's just red meat being thrown out into the into the in, up in the air for whatever vulture wants to jump down and grab it. I think if you pull the cannulas out and you didn't mean to do it, your outcome is predetermined. I don't think you're saving anybody. I think the troubleshooting part, we're not talking about it, I think the troubleshooting, there's, uh, there's uh, all of a sudden there's high pressure in the system, it's kinking, yes, the ECMO specialist can handle it, but the perfusions are very astute to like, uh, diagnosing the situation quicker. And this situation is more prone to happen when you're moving the patients. So that's why I think really it is troubleshooting. 
Mm. You agree? Mm. I agree. And it also mm. depends on your ECMO specialist. Uh, what, what's their training? Uh, how comfortable are how comfortable are they with this with evaluating those situations? Now, ideally, if you go through an ECMO specialist course, you should be able to manage understand what high line pressure means and, and things of the and things of that nature. But I know plenty uh, of perfusionists, Gil, yeah, and yeah. you do too. Okay, who have done some really the John? You too. In fact, your talk is going to be on the ten biggest mistakes of a new ECMO program. I know some perfusionists who probably should not be around ECMO at all, okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think an experienced, I think, you need, I think you need to revise the way you're viewing this to an experienced, qualified person. That's what I think you should say. That's my view. I disagree. I think anybody that will, I will when I call perfusion, <laughs> Why does that surprise I, me? I, when I call perfusion to be supporting that situation, I have full faith that they know exactly what they're doing because I know mm. they're calling them for a reason. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, we can discuss Dr. Joy Tola, I'm sure, is going to be adding on to this. So thank you. Sir. I, so I put you right here next to you. And, <laughs> and he's sharing my nicotine gum, which is great. <laughs> okay. We wanted to lay some cigars up. In fact, we may do that later. Dr. Samir, I'm sorry, did, were no, you done? We're done, sir. You're done? <laughs> I told you it's very simple to the point, sir. Okay. I'll so, have to talk more. So we need the uh, so we need Dr. Joy Thula's slides. So can we make a little commentation on? Uh, you on, can say anything. So, you want. Dr. Samir, uh, could elaborate on why would you think every patient qualifies for proning? Because let me ask, what's the contraindication for proning? Well. There's an indication for proning. Well, what's a contraindication for a hypoxic patient? The, why, why, would, why would you not prone them? Well, if a patient is hypoxic and you have all the other, you use nitric, you use flow land, you use everything, and now you're thinking, that's it, we are at the end of the line. You have to do proning, and late proning does not work. Well, late proning, late proning doesn't work. Right, but that's what you're saying, is that you're doing it as an absolute last stitch, so you have nothing to lose. But in reality, you have to do it early for it. No, no, I said, I said boss, I said yeah. early. I said, yeah, you, you think about it. it yeah. Uh, yeah, you did say that. You think yeah. about it, you have to do it. Yeah, yeah. There, there's two things if you think about it, you have to do it. Uh, uh, proning, you have to think about it, do it. Ecmo, think about it, do it. There's no boundary. Also, how long do you prone them for? As, uh, as long as my, my PO2 is going up and do it sustained, I have heard them prone. And I'll tell you, 12 hours, probably, there's some nursing issues yeah. about the pressure and all that. So we have to, usually, there's some recommendation, 12 and 8 hours. So not if, our, if they're doing hemodynamically stable and oxygenation is improving, 12 hours. 12 hours. And then you turn them, they turn back. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Dr. Joy Tola. All right. Let me uh, take the other side. <laughs> so I play the devil's advocate. So I, I guess um, one of the first questions, obviously, is the physiological effect of what does proning do? Yeah. Yeah. Will hear me? Yeah. Now. All right. So um, as this um, CT images show, we can see the, the change actually in the density of the lung and decrease in opacification once we turn the patient prone. This is from supine to prone to supine. And uh, those changes remain consistent. Obviously, that's where the whole um, um, endure started of uh, showing that proning is effective in humans in various um, hypoxemic respiratory failure predominantly in uh, ARDS. So this, the original hypothesis was um, when you prone a patient, um, the dorsal part of the lung is less, or essentially there is less alveoli, or sorry, less air entry in the dorsal part compared to the ventral part. And when you flip it over, now the dorsal part has better perfusion, and that's the reason why your oxygenation is improving. That actually did not turn out to be true in experimental models. I think this came in the dog studies from almost like in 1970s and 1980s, early 1980s. The, the truth essentially is you have a lot more lung parenchyma in the dorsal part of human lungs. So when you flip them over, that one actually gets better air aid compared to the ventral part. So even if there is a drop or atlexis in the ventral part, since the dorsal part is carrying majority of the parenchyma, you actually get an improvement in oxygenation just from that. Again, consider this, this is from a very highly controlled experimental setting. Now we'll, we're going to do the jump into what a clinical scenario is. Say somebody walks into Tombal um, 
and goes to the local hospital and what's happened, what ha happens to them when they do a prone positioning. We all know about uh, the whole physiological effects, the FRC changes compared to when you're sitting in a sitting position. The compliance pretty much remains the same, very similar to what uh, when you're in a, in a sitting position. But the, as uh, Dr. Hani was saying, oxygenation is almost as similar to when you're upright, when you do a proning. The work of breathing, we still don't know what the status is, but um, in general, when you're sitting up, your work of breathing is a lot less than when you're lying supine um, or flat on a bed. So taking that part, so this is where the whole details into the um, proning in clinical trials comes in. So I, I think there are eight studies which have been published so far, which essentially address the question in ARDS, what happens when you prone a patient and looking at the mortality. If we look at the first four columns, all of them showed there is no mortality benefit. But the details remain, essentially, if you look at it, 2001 and 2004, ARMA didn't come in where you have the low tidal volume approach to ARDS. So if you look at the tidal volumes in these patients, they were relatively higher than what is now considered to be um, essentially scientifically robust data and which has been verified that you need to go for a lower tidal volume. So if you see the first two studies, there was no protective ventilation. So the concern remained if they had very high tidal volumes and that's itself in you, um, gave you essentially ventilator induced lung injury. So there was no mortality benefit. Then you come into 2006 and 2009. I think by 2009, we had an idea about um, um, ArtsNet protocols. So as you can see, the tidal volume has actually significantly decreased. Now we are in 10 ml per kilo or less than 10 ml per kilo. But unfortunately, both of them did not show the benefits. So one of the concern was what was the timing? Um, how did they do it? What was the duration and everything else? So the latest one, the only study which has shown till date that you have a mortality benefit is the one from France. Uh, they had one center in Barcelona, rest of all the places were in, in France. Ran from 2008 to 2001, already ArtsNet protocol was already in place with your PEEP, with your FiO2, what's the optimal um, uh, um, range of uh, tidal volumes and PEEP you should be using in these patients. The cohort pretty much falls into very severe ARDS by the current Berlin criteria. Berlin criteria did not come in yet in 2013. So as you can see, the PF ratio is around 100. Almost 466 patients. Um, relatively, um, the PEEP at enrollment was stated to be around 10. But the biggest thing is they actually did for 17 hours for four days. That was the duration of the prone position. And this was the one which actually used 6 ml per kilo of predicted uh, weight on the patient, so the, the tidal volume, which we consider to be the standard of care. And they had a three-month follow-up. And definitely in this pa um, patients, you can see there was 41% mortality in the, in the patients who were supine compared to 23.6, so in, compared to in, in patients who were prone. So that's actually very remarkable. Now, what are the cons of it? If you look at the cons of it, you can actually just go to the study and look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov and look at the contraindications which they put up and what was the protocol of it. Very small cohort of patients with ARDS. I think they screened around or they initially started with some 50,000 odd ARDS patients. And the patients who actually qualified for the screening were around 1,434, very, very small person out of which almost 858 turned out to be non-eligible. So we are talking about slicing the bread down to literally to the center. Very pure um, or uniform and, and very small percentage of what a, a regular run of the mill ARDS patient would be. Exclusion criteria means ICP was elevated, you had a DVT within two days. If you had persistent shock, um, any use of non-invasive ventilation uh, before at the point of recruitment received any sort of inhaled NO if they had chest tubes. So pretty much you are like eliminating all the things which would complicate your strategy or which would complicate proning a patient. Um, and if you look at shock, one of the major reasons for ARDS essentially is infection. And anybody with severe vasogenic shock and multi-organ dysfunction pretty much automatically got disqualified. And if as I'm, I'm sure Dr. Hani and all the people you guys have seen, ArtsNet, I mean, it's ARDS in the absence of an infection is a very different beast and a very small cohort. I mean, the majority of it still would be in a setting of an infection. The PEEP was less than 10. Uh, one of the downsides of this was it actually does not fit into an ArtsNet criteria. If you're using a higher FiO2, I think in this one they used it around 0 0.6 and higher, your PEEP should be a lot higher. For some reason, the PEEPs were lower in this study. 
Uh, the SOFA scores and the pressure usage, again, was very high in the supine group. So did we falsely pick up a group which was a lot sicker and made to look, and the prone people actually turned out to be a lot better because just of this baseline difference in them. And uh, in prone patients, some reason they had a higher amount of neuromuscular blockage. I can see it. One of the easiest way you can actually prone a patient is just make them paralyze them because you don't have a less risk of everything else. They're a lot more malleable to turn around and everything. Is that a good thing in the big picture? Um, maybe, maybe not. So again, there may be some inherent differences in the study as such in both the, the study group and the control group, which may have made uh, the prone position to be our prone position to be a lot better than what it was. And, and the key, which we, I'm sure we're going to take our swords out and then have a dual about it, is the experience of the staff. Would I take somebody like this and say, uh, my favorite place, Nacogdoches, and if they go to a community hospital and tell them, hey, you should be proning this patient. Probably the staff is not so used to it. I mean, they may not understand all the inherent challenges which are in there compared to, in, all, in this study, they actually mentioned it in the protocol that the hospitals where people use this, they had more than five years of experience. So the ICUs already had an inbuilt experience in the staff and the exposure. So obviously that's the one which makes the biggest difference. So we can talk about a hypothesis Next, we get roll into to, into a real world setting. Obviously, the practical aspects of it, the most important thing. If you are just unable to do it safely, then it defeats the whole purpose of doing a study and doing proning. I think that's where um, um, uh, the biggest issue comes in. No doubt about it. Um, it's physiologically and clinically in a controlled experimental setting, definitely improves oxidation. I don't think there is any doubt about that. But we had multiple studies which looked at which improved oxygenation ARDS, but they never translated into benefits and mortality. So there's a whole plethora of um, issues with it because we are talking about a disease which has its own evolution. Um, you have your injury first, then your oxygenation gets worse, and then they sustain it. If you don't do anything else, what is the natural course? Probably it's a higher mortality rate. So the biggest intervention which still to, till date the one which has shown that you have a mortality benefit is low tidal volume strategy. And, and if you look at the meat of it, why is that? Is decrease in probably ventilator associated lung injury. Already the lung is injured, now on top of it, you're adding a ventilator and we're making it worse. Now we have reversed that back again. And then we have gone into all this low peep strategy, high peep strategy, we're looking at volume status. We have actually put in esophageal monitors in ArtsNet studies and looked at actually what is the difference in plateau pressure and Absolutely, all of them show, yes, oxygenation comes up. Unfortunately, mortality does not change much. So maybe we are not altering the natural course of the disease. All we are trying to do, this is something I think I'll open it up to the group, is make the num numbers look better for ourselves when we're wrong. Maybe on a bigger picture, it doesn't matter. The disease is going to take its own course. And we still have not figured a way out how can we alter it so that more people survive once they develop ARDS. I think that's where I'm, I'm going to open it up to group. Joe, I would love to hear your comments on this. Well, I think you bring some excellent points up. Um, I, I want to first ask, we have an audience question from Scott Jenkins, and he would like to know everyone's thoughts on the recent article that came out of Chicago on the use of the ProTech Duo for uh, BV ECMO not associated with right heart failure, but just uh, for the purposes of VV ECMO. So we'll start with you, Dr. Joy Thola, and go around. So if you look at the study, they just talk about, I think if I remember it right, it was a 40 patients who were enrolled. Um, um, there's no standardization. So for me, as I did, they just cherry picked the patients whom they wanted to be included in the study, which they wanted to report. Two, all the patients were on a ventilator, and then they went on to an ECMO or a protect. Uh, dual uh, lumen cannula for the VV ECMO needs, and there was a 100% recovery, which I'm sure if you all guys, if I look at it, I, you would be like, really? Is that true? But again, that also says you probably all you picked up was the patients who may probably, the first question when I, I, mean, I discussed in the, within our group is, the first question anybody would ask is, were these patients supposed to be even on an ECMO? That would be the one, based on what the clinical experience has been. The others contend, or maybe that's a question, is they put in an um, interesting point. 
maybe we early ECMO is the name to the game rather than trying to use ECMO as a rescue when everything has fallen down. It's like pretty much nuclear bomb dropping on Hiroshima. Now you're trying to figure out, okay, how can I patch up all this together? Maybe the idea should have been we should have just bombed or prevented the bomb from happening. So maybe that's where it is. I find it, yes, it's very interesting. Protect Duo has excellent benefits compared to an Avalon, which itself is a very challenge, especially even on a supine patient. Just from shift to shift, sometimes your reperfusion percentage just goes up some reason. The, the position just gets malpositioned. Like this, uh, the, the syndrome I talk in my ICU, it's called a creeping Dobov syndrome. Some reason Dobovs are all in post pyloric in the evening, and by next morning they all come out into the into the antrum of the stomach. Man, things happen. You're moving the patient, the nursing staff is cleaning up. Am I saying is it intentionally done? It's not. It's very difficult with an Avalon, especially which is so positionally dependent. Protec at least goes beyond that, so you're guaranteed unless you have some structural issues, either in your pulmonary, um, uh, sorry, um, in your valve or some of those issues. Other than that, at least you're guaranteed your recirculation percentage is a lot lesser with a protect cannula. Definitely it's a use, but you know, overall picture of if COVID-19 ARD is putting everybody in, intubated and then putting on a protect duo and saying we have a 100% survival rate, I just find it very unbelievable. I think it was just cherry picking the subjects. Mm, I, I tend to agree with you, Dr. Samir, your thoughts? Okay, you're going to be between us, okay, because uh, this is going to be tough right now. <laughs> just telling you. Okay, so uh, my thoughts, with my true thoughts is, uh, I instead of saying it all, but uh, let me tell you, not just unfortunately, I looked at the numbers, well, fortunately, I looked at the numbers yesterday. I mean, I believe if anybody going to get femoral cannulation, I mean, uh, IJ cannulation, it should be a protect door. My, my, my book is the standard of care right now. Absolutely. Okay, and that's what I think. It should be a protect door. Mm -hmm. Don't play around. And I'll tell you, our survival, the part I disagree with you, uh, Soma, is I looked at our numbers for VV ECMO uh, survival, and not that we were the best center ever. That's what I'm talking about, Houston Methods, and I'm going to call it out. It's about, uh, not that we're the best center, but our VV ECMO survival, which everybody, I guess, uh, neck will get a protect door. I mean, this is a mix between protect door and fam fam. So our survival is 70% for COVID 19 on VV ECMO for COVID patients. And I'll tell you, that's an amazing number. That's way, way above the literature, way, way above the literature. So I'll call it up, and I will tell you, our surgeons that put the protect door, they're amazing at placing it. They're placing it very well. They have no issues. So I don't have, so I do, I, I mean, I like the study, and I don't think, we're not cherry picking anybody. It's really the side, the cannulation side that the surgeon decides. Is it gonna be fem fem or IJ fem? If they said IJ fem, it's a protect door and a femoral cannula. And I'll tell you, so the, the numbers speak for themselves. But you don't need a femoral, unless you're BA, you don't need a femoral cannula if you have a project duo. I mean, unless you're a larger patient. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, most of our patients in Texas. So you're talking about to have enough flow? Yeah. I mean, that's my big problem with the project duo. But let, let's just go on. John. Yeah, there's, it's interesting. I didn't read that particular article, but based on what you uh, gentlemen just said, if, if you, on our COVID patients, we have about a 70 or 70 plus percent survival also with right IJ and right femoral cannulation which you would think maybe that's going to inherently cause a lot of mixing and wasn't be that efficient, but we've actually had quite a bit of success with that. We just thought it was um, easier and you could have larger cannulas with two versus one because with the Protec, even with a 31, which we did recently, uh, we do a lot of them, you do have a lot higher pressures. You have a lot more high resistance, both negative and positive. And I know that um, when you put it in as an RVAT, at least you've eliminated the mixing element of it. So whatever it is you're... VV performances, you're doing all of it. You're getting four and a half liters of flow, that's what you're able to oxygenate. Whereas with almost any other aspect of cannulation, you're gonna have a, a significant or somewhat of, uh, significant uh, measure of mixing. That's going Which on. is measurable with yeah. the transonic device that right. I have talked about many times, mm -hmm. uh, which I think should also be a standard of care if you do ECMO with any cannulation technique for VV, but also for intra-oxygenator intra blood volume to recognize if your anticoagulation strategy is not working well and you have a large clot burden. But, um, but you know, going back to your discussion, you're doing double cannulation technique, femoral access for uh, inferior vena cable drainage, right IJ, superior vena cava return. And it's That's your preferred technique. And it's important that you aim that right IJ cannula into the atrium. You can't just have them facing each other, and they have to be at least 15 centimeters apart. You do any of those things wrong, and you're going to have a lot of mixing. 
Um, in my talk, I'm going to show an example of that. Um, I think as far as any study is concerned, until I see that others can duplicate others' results and you have a multi-center aspect to it, I would always, you know, hold back on it and see if others can duplicate others' results because it's a very reasonably low percentage of people that can duplicate mm -hmm. other people's results. So I think mm -hmm. that would be... Uh, well, I don't buy the Chicago uh, yeah. paper either. I do think it was cherry-picked. I agree with Dr. Soma entirely on that, but I think that it has caused a knee-jerk reaction by a lot of places now trying to put that in. And it is a challenge to put in if you're not mm -hmm. skilled. Okay. Avalon may be challenging. This is even more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I do think that you are, I don't really think you get the flows because the, it's much longer, number one. You may have more effective flow, but I think that the hemolysis that's generated the high resistance um, uh, uh, that gives you the lower flows also, heat generation in your pump, there's a lot of factors involved that I think yeah, it's a trade-off. I don't think it's just all good. I don't think they talk about the bad stuff. Well, we use the ProTec cannula only and hook it up to not their pump or, or their oxygenator. We have mm -hmm. to go with like a CMAG Quadrox with a ProTec cannula mm -hmm. because of the downfalls we've had with the pump and the oxygenator. However, getting back to one thing, when people say it's a 31 French cannula, it's a dual cannula. Right. The two cannulas inside of that are right. what? 14? Well, the access 15? is probably slightly larger. So, so I would probably yeah. say the access I mean, is eight is uh, probably 18 and 18 or 20. And then well, the rest is, is that written percent. anywhere? Does anybody know exactly what I those don't. are? It, it, it'll be published. I don't know the number, but yeah, I would but, imagine but that's how it is. But the say, length is much longer than an Avalon. So that yeah, length and then is you have what the, causes so the So if anybody said to you, I'd put it in 18 French venous cannula, you would tell them, I won't, be, I won't be able to flow with that, right? But right. that's what happens with with some of those. So, I mean, something to think about. I've had that happen. Gil? So, so to Dr. Samir's point, we've had a lot of success using the ProTec. ProTec isn't new to us in regards to COVID. We've been using that prior prior to COVID. Uh, we've used it on fairly large patients. Uh, those patient, patients we've all had good success with. You do see higher line pressures. The line pressures don't exceed what, you're, what you would consider your normal limits, though. Um, there hasn't been there hasn't been an issue as far as hemolysis. Uh, we haven't seen it in the urine or anything in that regard. So your uh, LDHs don't climb a little more. LDH LDH has gone up some on some patients. It's that's patient dependent though. It's not every patient. Sure. Uh, and you you can see that with I mean even with fem fem cannulation you'll see that as you as you start to see your oxygenator potentially start to clot off. So you can't use that. I don't think we can use that as a sole indicator uh, and say that the ProTech wouldn't be the ideal cannula. Because for me, any patient that you want to prone, I would say ProTech is what you want to use. Uh, Absolutely. Especially, especially as opposed to the Avalon. Like, like everyone at the table knows, Avalon is very positional cannula. You move that patient over and your flow is going to likely drop, drop from three liters down to one and a half liters. I, I, so. <laughs> I don't mean to, I don't, you know, please forgive me, but yeah. that's not my experience. Yeah. I, I don't have that experience using yeah. Avalon where mm -hmm. we flip the patient when we do choose to do that or sit them up, which actually works a lot better for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's why right IJ cannulation is far superior than femoral uh, because, mm -hmm. one, I think there's a huge infection risk being in the groin. If you can stay out of the groin, you're better off. I think yeah. that's just reality. But I find sitting the patient up at 45 degrees gives me as much benefit as proning them does. That's mm -hmm. at least my anecdotal experience um, yeah. from the cases that I've done. Serena? So for uh, me, my experience is all gonna be based on transplant. So we do use the project as a bridge to get them to transplant, and our patients have done very well on that. So. Is that for right heart failure though? No. For lung no, transplant. No, for right, lung you transplant, but do you have right heart dysfunction because of hypertension where they're having so you're using it purely as a bridge as a bridge, as a bridge. Mm -hmm. so just pulmonary purposes yes. not for the right heart uh protective strategy yeah, straight for pulmonary as a bridge for a transplant mm -hmm. and, and in regards to that like i said you know we we all agree for the chicago paper you need a lot much larger sample uh patient sample size before we can determine if that's really mm -hmm. if that's really the treat or the way to go but as far as when we talk about lung transplants us putting those patients on early, getting them up, ambulating them, we have a higher, uh, much higher success rate after their Absolutely. transplant. Absolutely, yes. They right. Now, that's well. another, I'm glad you just brought that up. That's another thing that is uh, kind of interesting for me is I hear people talk about, and John, I think you might bring this up in your talk. I'm not sure if you will. But, you know, ambulating a transplant patient 
having a transplant patient on ECMO, mm -hmm. they don't probably need quite as much flow. They need some support, but you want to keep them conditioned. Correct. But they have a chronic disease that they have adapted to, mm -hmm. and now you're putting this cannula in. Very different than an acute illness, COVID-associated ARDS, influenza-associated ARDS, sepsis-associated ARDS, whatever it is. Those patients are not getting up walking around. Right. And I think there's a misconception. I hear it a lot. Well, why can't we just extubate our ECMO patient now? Or why can't we? No, it doesn't. It just doesn't work that way in the acute setting. And I think a lot of people in new programs that start don't understand that. Um, okay, so let's see where we're at here. Can I just say one thing? Of course. Okay. You didn't realize how good your numbers are. 70% survival you have on BV. Right. I mean, that's an amazing number. I mean, that's something you should be very proud of. Thanks. Mm -hmm. There's uh, COVID uh, centers with 0%. I know. Mm -hmm. These guys are doing an amazing job. Well, you know, I, and Dr. Dr. Uh, Soma, I want you to elaborate on this too, but I'm just going to tell you our anecdotal experience, and I want to hear yours. I want to talk about uh, a couple of other things. For us... If you've been on the ventilator at max vent support for less than seven days, so one day one through day six, and we put you on ECMO, our survival, not quite as good as yours, Dr. Samir, but we're running about 60 to 65%, just pretty doggone good on ECMO patients. The patients that were 14 days or longer on max vent support having failed, that went on ECMO, we have zero survivors. Mm -hmm. No survivors. So, and I don't know any, we don't have any from seven to day 13, so I can't tell you what happens there. I know that if it's under seven days, our survival is 60 to 65%. If it if we're at an outside hospital, two weeks, three weeks, on the vent, not ARDSnet uh, protocol, sent to us, put them on ECMO because that's the last ditch effort, they all, they, none of them have survived. And what I think, is your view? I, mean, I kind of uh, tend to agree with you. So again, it goes back to again. I think in all this humdrum, um, it's a very short sighted. I think we are all talking, looking at different aspects of the elephant and trying to make a conclusion. If you look at the bigger elephant asset, what does ARDS do? So first, you have an initial insult. You develop these extensive highland membranes. Your oxygenation goes um, down significantly because you're, you have significant diffusion impairment. Then the lung tries to heal, you get into an organizing phase, and then you get into a fibrotic phase. That is the natural. Now, of all those people, some people, it may not be extensive, it heals faster, and they may go not go into the fibrotic phase. In some people, it just gets, gets extensive um, amounts of lung parenchyma get into organized phase, diffusion capacity is still impaired. So what is causing the death in these patients at the juncture is the oxygenation aspect. So that we have worked around. The only way before ECMO or extracorporeal circulation came in was a very unnatural way of doing positive pressure ventilation, which is completely unphysiological. But that's the best tool we had. We kind of improvised on it. We realized, you know what, dilating the normal alveoli too much and then making them collapse itself causes injury, a physical injury to the alveolus, which actually perpetuates the injury even further. Because now already certain part of the lung is damaged. Now you're damaging the, the normal lung, which is there by all the interventions, all the positive pressure ventilation. So that's where ArtsNet made the biggest jump on it. Look at low tidal volumes, higher peak, so we are not causing the ventilator-associated lung injury. Yes, and associated with that, we have improved the oxygenation. Now we are talking about the next aspect of it. In those ARDS patients where you are on a ventilator and you're still unable to oxygenate or it is not normal or it is not optimal, now you have an extracorporeal oxygenation, various tools we can talk about in the details. Is it just a femoral canalization, IJ canalization, whichever way, dual lumens, single lumens. But now I'm improving the oxygenation. Then you are asking a question, does it improve the mortality? That is, I mean, we are talking about a highly selected way we are coming in. Yes, there is a room or scope for improvement in optimizing that aspect of it, using a dual lumen, a lower volume or a lower flow, decreasing the recirculation so that all the injury which potentially you may cause by that ECMO cannula are coming down. Then the patient as whole, very easy. We all know if it's a patient walks into the hospital, has an acute surgery or some sort of it and is prolonged 
um, essentially staying in a supine position itself cause decondition. That sets you up for all the nosocomial issues which arise, having a catheter in your bladder, having an NG tube through your nose, or different lines and everything else. Now you're talking about acquiring different infections and everything, then the deconditioning aspect of it. If they are unable to mobilize, they're more likely to stay in bed, develop a DVT. So we are talking about it's a whole downstream effect of it. It's very nice. We can just focus on the question, hey, does ECMO benefit or not? I don't think anybody at this table disagrees with the fact it improves oxygenation. But beyond that physiological aspect, if you take a patient as a whole during a hospital stay, does it actually change the outcome for the patient? That has still, we have been unable to, as you know, in all the arts, at least the couple of ECMO trials which have come out have non, I, I, all of them have showed it doesn't benefit the patient as such because now we are taking a step back and looking at the patient as a whole. Similar to that in a transplant, we get all the calls and everything else. You have a bad ILD. Am I going to transplant everybody? Uh, that's the first talk I tell them. You know what? Surgery is the easiest aspect of the whole thing. Put in on a pump, put in two new lungs, pray to God that you don't develop severe PGD and you're there, you're there. The, 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 the game or where the biggest challenge happens is how is that patient going to recover? That's where we talk about why we want them to mobilize. If the guy is just bed bound, you change his lung, he's still going to be bed bound. What yes, did you done. change on his life? No, that's where essentially the, like we like to have awake at most. If given a choice, I would rather actually put a patient on a tray collar and do an ECMO or just on an ECMO circuit. You can argue another way. Maybe their oxygenation wasn't bad, but I can say, you know what, one biggest thing I'm doing is I'm not giving a ventilator associated lung injury Absolutely. on top of everything to this patient, but using a cannula, which seems to be relatively safe. It has come to its own challenges. Some people clot up, hemolysis, dislodgement, infections, think that they are there, but I have improved and supported their oxygenation. I am hope if I'm in a very, um, like, Methodist, my prior um, institute, we were very great. We used to ambulate them on an ECMO camera. Absolutely. We have videos and everything, and that's the same thing. Why is that? Because, one, we want to keep the patient awake and up. That itself adds a lot of benefit to that. Less issues of having DVTs, less issues of having other things. They have more control over it if they're having pain, they're having something wrong with the bladder or something, they convey it to the nurse and go on. I think that's where that's where the biggest change happens. Absolutely. I think in that regards, I think we can talk about hundred different things about how ECMO. Is. No doubt about it. ECMO causes excellent oxygenation on a patient. Now, would I put a protect duo on a patient who's hundred kilos? Even if you have zero recirculation, the amount of oxygenation percentage to the total cardiac output may not be so different. Or maybe it may not add that extra edge compared to somebody who's fifty kilos. And now you're running like almost 40% of his cardiac output, you're hyper-oxygenating it. Just by that, probably he can maintain physiological oxidation for his survival rather than having a ventilator, I think, or rather take that. So I think that's where the details come in, and that's where being part of a, a team and everything else, um, step back at it, why did ECMO actually come into the whole thing, is we have better oxygenators, we have better cameras. The technology bypass has been, what, 1950s, Dr. Debeke started with a rolling pump arm, Thing, but it has always been there. I think that's that's where we need to go on. If you ask me, I think the evolution would be down the lane. Maybe in ARDS, we won't be intubating patients. We will actually be trying doing an ECMO on them and then keeping them and going forward with it. Now, if somebody requires both the support and still their oxygenation is very dicey, now you're talking about severe lung injury. Yes, on a short term, I've supported them, but how is that lung going to evolve to acquire a diffusion capacity, that answer we have been unable to answer so far. Can I ask and you a question? I mean, I hate to interrupt you, but I really want to, before I forget, do you think there is any recovery for COVID-19 for fibrotic lung? Absolutely. That's a very good question. So we transplanted two patients over the last week. Um, both of them have been into, one was 60 days out, uh, one was uh, 55 days out from the initial, or at least from the time of diagnosis of ARDS in the sense on the same ER visit, they have an X-ray with infiltrates. Their PAO2 is like in less than 80 or less than 60 on room air. One had actually 40 or something of that sort. Oh. Um, and, and, and COVID ARDS got everything which is there. The only thing these were lucky with, they were never intubated. Been on high flow oxygen, intermittent non-invasive, um, uh, with uh, again going back on a non-rebreather, chugged along, got remdesivir, got dexamethasone, got convalescent plasma, high-dose steroids, but 
I mean, so again, I'm talking about a very highly cherry-picked patient. I mean, I say it's a natural course, but why am I interested in that? Is one, they were ambulatory. At that juncture, we felt, you know what, still have extensive ground glassing on their um, uh, CT scans. One guy had a lot more difference. One had some smoking history. The other one had some occupational exposure. Maybe, maybe did not have um, baseline lung disease. I cannot say it at this juncture, radiologically or clinically. And at that point of time, PF ratio is still really poor. Clinically, means one guy, he hardly, if he gets out of bed, he used to go into 50s and 60s. So it was a whole act of God to get him to move or convince the nursing staff, it's okay. You can still move him for a little bit. But anyway, so if you look at the pathology, it's so fascinating. It means we read it in textbooks and people forget basic pathology. This is not like a one-shot disease. You have it in one snapshot and next way, next day your lung is normal. It evolves. It's like having a bad wound. It will scar up. Extensive organization. And one guy means the whole alveolar, you had type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia and everything. So as a pulmonologist, if I look at it and if you ask me, what do you think is the chance that this lung is going to ever go back to where it was, the guy would breathe room air and be fine? I would say minimal at this juncture. And again, this shows in the context, all the known therapies, at least which we use right now, using steroids, using convalescent plasma. Again, trust me, both these patients were tested three times prior um, listing that they were COVID negative. The explant lung itself was tested for coronavirus. That was negative. They all had IgG antibodies against coronavirus. The virus has been cleared. What I am dealing with right now is the explosion has happened. Now I'm dealing with the aftermath. So uh, obviously that's the reason why we listed to them, obviously, extensive group discussions going on. And that was the conclusion. And obviously that's the reason why we were so interested in the pathology. Is again a learning lesson. Now I can tell you, so... If you have somebody who's already six to eight weeks, extensive ground glassing on the CT, significant oxygenation defect, then you need to think that's how ARDS goes on to. These are the people are very less likely to actually ever recover back, probably minuscule. They will have extensive chronic defects in their oxygenation. Ability. Now, transplant, yes or no, that's obviously a, 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 a mutual decision with the patient because it, is it a perfect cure? Absolutely not. It's, you're replacing one. You're trying to get it and you're playing, hedging your bets. But that's where it is. So in that way, when people, as you rightly said, 14 weeks, one month after the RDS, if I put an ECMO camera in, yeah, numbers look great when you're around, you know, oxygenation it looks great. But what does it do to the patient? I, the I don't think it doesn't do any much mm -hmm. for the patient. Okay. And I think, too, that, you know, we're using neuromuscular blockades. We're using high sedation on these patients. Um, they are deconditioning tremendously. You have somebody who is already compromised. Now we compromise them even more. So even if we wean this patient on ECMO, off of ECMO, we get to that point. Then you have the challenge of being able to wean them off the vent and they can actually breathe on their own. Um, and what is going to be their quality of life? Now, I understand everybody has their own opinion about Absolutely. what is a quality of life, but I think that we throw an awful lot of resources, which, you know, is not an unlimited amount. We have, we have limited resources, personnel, equipment, disposables, etc. And sometimes I feel that we are failing in our ability to set a protocol with defined inclusion, exclusion criteria, and making non-emotional decisions about you fit in the, you, you meet the inclusion criteria or you fall outside of it. And the decisions I think are going to, I think those are hard decisions that I understand. They're, they're, they're for us as clinicians, very difficult to make, but I think if we don't, we're going to potentially collapse a system and a lot more people will end up suffering as a result of it. Now, that's my philosophical opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, you're right. We don't have endless resources. The other day, one of my um, med school seniors posted a practices in India, patient, 32-year-old lady, primary pH, RV failure, and they don't have cross-cycling infusions in India. And so again, I mean, we are in a very resource-rich resource -rich. country. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the things I don't even think about. I mean, so one of the biggest cultural shock for me when I moved from India to here was people don't recycle their surgical tools. I was like, we have a suture removal kit. 
and you just throw the scissors away. I looked at them, I'm like, that's a bloody waste of money. But now I do it myself too. Yes. <laughs> like when I was back in India, it's like everything was collected back again. We autoclaved it and somebody packed it up back again. But that's, I'm talking about the resources aspect. So you make do what it is at that point of time. But that's that's where we are. I think. I have another like a question. I'm sorry before I yeah. forget because you're, you're an authority. Oh my God. Uh, now let's, you believe in ours net and I do too. So let's say you prone the patient. Are you able to, are you tolerating higher PK weight pressures because the proning, especially if it's an obese patient? Oh boy. I'm um, sorry, so I have to put you on the spot. I, I have not faced that situation, to be honest. But if you look at back at the physiological studies, apparently when you have proning, your abdomen doesn't actually, doesn't, it actually allows you to ventilate your lung a lot more by the position of the diaphragm and everything. And two, I think there was one study for emeritoid which looked at intra-abdominal pressures and they actually made a comment, if you have higher intra-abdominal pressures, those are the ones who benefit more from proning than patients who have a, a normal intra-abdominal pressure. Maybe it was got to do with the what you call how their obesity was spread. Is it more central or and is it more different? That's the issue. I was faced with a patient that, that the external thoracic pressure is very high. Let's put it this way, okay? So, and the PKW pressures, I had to tolerate, so are you okay tolerating higher, you know? The higher peak and plateau. At the juncture, if you're talking about proning a patient, so obviously the first caveat is you're now you're worried about is oxygenation bad or not. Again, it's a trial. I mean, so like many things, essentially it's a physiological trial. You just flip them. Really? If it, it into it, it's worked very great. well, but I had to tell you higher peak airway pressure. You, know, you answered your question there okay. itself. It's very difficult to say at that juncture. It is an experimental trial, essentially, at that juncture. Well, yes, it is. And I will tell you that I have seen this with this is again my anecdotal evidence with these two eyes looking that I have been able to take patients and it's one of the reasons again I don't like femoral invasions is that if I set them up and especially when they have big bellies and it's pushing when they're laying down up on their diaphragm decreasing their lung size and you get them high enough almost I wonder if proning or or some type of of, of, of brace that you could actually almost put them, put them up, up almost 90 degrees or as close to 90 degrees as you can. Just dropping that belly down, I see their ventilatory peak and plateau pressures come Balance straight some. down and their oxygenation looks much better. Absolutely. Just by doing that. I have a question for the panel because in our experience, I won't say what it was, but have you seen in your experience that being modestly obese and, and the worst, worst, more is worse, it definitely had a higher morbidity with this corona. I don't think our patients that are more severe seem to be a lot higher percentage of people that are that are mildly to, to, to severely overweight. The ones that do very poor. Down here, down, so down here in Texas, the majority of our patients are, are obese, mm -hmm. and actually, I don't think that has really contributed to our to a high mortality rate at our hospital for the COVID so, for the COVID patients. Uh, like, our patients, regardless, COVID or not, are, gonna, are fairly large. And uh, our, like I said, our mortality rate is still still on, on the better side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's early days in the pandemic. I yeah. think if you look back, what, December last week or December, first patient walked into Wuhan, mm -hmm. and that's where the patient zero is. We're still like, what, ninth month in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at the data, it's like, one week I see one paper saying, oh, everyone's obesity is big, and next week you see it, oh, it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's all over the place. And if you go back to another infectious disease, I think the best one would be H1N1, where California Department of Health published their data on how H1N1 affected. And one of the two biggest risk factors, if you look at it, was obesity and having chronic lung disease mm -hmm. um, with ARDS and mortality as such. I think it depends on, if you're in Texas, our, our BMI normal range is 28. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's yeah. from 28 to 30, maybe not much of a difference. <laughs> if you go to Italy, maybe, yeah, their normal range is probably 23, 28 yeah, yeah. to 30 makes a big difference for yeah. them, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's so a short true. answer. I mean, me and Joe, we fall into the other end. <laughs> I've been on a diet. <laughs> oh, All right, me, I fall into the other end. Joe does it. So yeah, then Dr. Samir looks, I know everybody's noticed. Looks I mean, he, is, look, he looks fantastic. This is from, this is caused from cucumber salad. Oh, Lord. Christina's <laughs> cucumber salad. Christina's uh, health bad will be on there, yeah. Exactly. But I think that for, from my perspective, and Dr. Soma, please elaborate, and Dr. Samir, everybody on the panel, 
I think for me, it's the obesity may not, and survival is a relative term, right? right. We were able to wean the patient off ECMO. There's the, let's right. check the box. Right. That's a, we survived that. Right. That's not survival. Right. right. And I think that just obese people, John, to your point, morbidly obese to super obese, BMIs of 38, 40, yeah. 46, 52, 56, which we see, um, have little, I can, I think they may survive ECMO, but are they going to walk out of that hospital? They already at a BMI of 56, mm-hmm. probably having a hard time walking to begin with. How are you going to rehab that patient? That's right. I just think it yeah. has to be, again, you know, I mean, it becomes emotional. But Physicians, not really. you, you, know, you know a patient mm-hmm. very well that was obese before ECMO, and lost a lot of weight on ECMO, and now is doing amazing. He was not out. that obese. And I you're talking you about, no, now, you're talking about to be fair, he right was now. also no. in really good shape as well. He, no, was. Before, he was. He, he was a police he's officer. Shaking. After ECMO was much better than before ECMO. That's yeah. the great thing. He went he on the ECMO a, weight loss diet. Yes. <laughs> but I think that him being in shape He was a police officer. He was conditioned. He had the right mentality. He got jumped on very quickly. He got put on ECMO quickly. We didn't beat his lungs up with the ventilator. He got, he was given only the remdesivir. And, you know, Dr. Samir, I think that we don't, I think there's more, so much more we don't know than do know. You can take two obese, don't take away my lecture. You can take two obese patients and one will respond one way, one will respond another. So to your point, John, I, I know someone personally who is a very nice person and, you know, this person, you know, carries a little, I mean, a little too much weight, needs to work on it. And, um, you know, they got COVID and they felt bad for two or three days, were tested a number of times, were actually, was actually positive um, and uh, confirmed as positive, now have the antibodies as well. So there's no doubt it was COVID. But this person should have, by all of my understanding of what I hear, should have probably succumbed to the disease and just had a mild form of it and did fine. I don't think we know what the heck is going on, to be frank with you. I think we're all pontificating a whole bunch of BS, because I don't think we know. Absolutely. I think that's what you're right. Absolutely. I mean, as a physician, one of the biggest thing is the pressure to do something. I think that's what we are at. And if you look at the amount of plethora of compounds which are being tested, we are pretty much throwing the kitchen sink at it Mm -hmm. and saying, okay, something may stick to it and maybe it will help. To going back to the data, I'm sure we all have positive experience on some patient whom we felt was an extreme case, had 99% chance of failing and will make it out. Like I tell my fellows, one of the best way to look at it, look back at the lung cancer survival data. You look at it on stage four, there is a five year survival of 4.8%. Mm-hmm. And we usually talk if you have a stage four lung disease, that means that's a death now. Maybe there are some people who mm-hmm. defy the odds, the nature of the cancer, the location of the cancer, where the max was, maybe that makes a difference, but again, just based on it, would we say, oh, we need to be as aggressive on all stage for walking? Maybe that, that again, maybe a little um, um, too much, I would think. Maybe that makes it a little irrational thought. Again, at the end of the day, my philosophy, as I always say, I think the patient needs to drive. It should be a shared decision making, either with the patient or whoever is making decisions for them. At the juncture, as, as Joe was rightly pointing out, this is very different from what we have seen before. This is not like an ILD exacerbation where they had a chronic disease, now something it has played up and now they had the time to adjust to it, get over it, or have at least make peace with the disease. We are talking about acting normal and suddenly six weeks later, you're at death door. So it's, it's a very difficult situation in that way. And obviously then the pressure is, let's try doing everything which we can and then going from there. I think hopefully, I think down the lane, I think people are more realizing now as a group, after the Italian experience and everything else, we have realized maybe not intubate everybody who's hypoxic. Just put them on high flow, like I can take about the, both the patients. Yeah, that's I think probably saved them too. In the, at least give them an option rather than just intubating and putting them on positive pressure ventilation. So I think that's something which we are learning as a group and as, as the information is spreading. Hopefully next year, if we have it around the same time, we'll have a lot better answers, which have at least have some reality. Well, I'm hoping I'm right and Dr. Samir is wrong that come November 3rd, this all of this will be over. Oh. So that's my thought. Oh, let's, okay. not even, let's not even go there. So let's not even go there, please. Okay. So can, uh, how about if we do this? John, do you want to jump right into your lecture? 
Sure, whatever you because I think it's from. timely. I think it's perfect. You, does everybody is everybody feeling okay? Yeah. Like everybody strong. Everybody feeling strong, Doctor Samir. You you yeah. don't need any special extra accommodation or anything. No, we got coffee before my. Uh, I will time. bring you some more coffee. I can get you some coffee. I can have that happen. So, John, why don't we jump right we into have your clicker? And, and this has just oh, been sorry. Just, no, I think they, it's the other one. Uh, this has been fascinating because you guys have all hit on half of some of the things that we're going to uh, <laughs> talk about, which are great because it was great leading. But, um, Joe, you surround me with some heavy hitters here today. You know, I got <laughs> to sound like I know what I'm talking about. The, um, the thing about this, uh, Joe, when I approached you about this idea, so if you go back, we're talking about when COVID first started, but when it really started, you know, getting serious over here four, five, six months ago now, we thought, uh, oh, we're just going to get this avalanche of, avalanche of cases that are going to be overwhelmed, but then they took away the routine cases, right? So what happened was a, a perfusionist uh, were sitting at home because we didn't have the routine cases. We had the COVIDs coming through, but it weren't that many, but the, it didn't make up for the loss of the routine cases. So I was doing full-time macro, and so basically, um, you know, we had staff sitting at home, whereas, you know, so I took to the road and traveled and did, I got a lot of calls and demands to come help do ECMOs around the country. And what happened is, you know, a lot of these places that have a hub and spoke model where you have this one premier center, like for example, uh, I want to say it's Cedar sinai in California. It's a major hub to a many, many spokes that will either send them ECMO patients or they'll be, you know, quick put on and send. Well, these hub, big hub centers got overwhelmed and they said, wait, 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 you're keeping your ECMO now. You, you're not sending. So all of a sudden you have these little programs that suddenly found themselves having an ECMO program that before were packing ship centers, right? And so they were, they were needing help. They were needing coverage. They need perfusions to come in. So I probably went around to 12, 15, maybe even 20 different centers. I mean, there were some weeks where I was bounced around different places every day where I could drive to. And um, a lot of these were, this is our first ECMO. This is our second one we've ever done. And um, then I went to places that had 0% success. They had a complete ECMO uh, ICU, all COVID ECMO ICU. And I said, you guys have any survivors? And um, I, I think there was maybe, no, we haven't. And I found some very interesting things. I started looking around, and then you go to places like all of you guys are at, where you really have expert in this in the in this field, and you have you have a percentage of survival. The biggest stark difference. And I started thinking to myself one day, what are some of these differences that I've seen out there? And and you thought it was a good idea to talk about this. So what we've all talked about earlier just now was really relevant to some of the things that are going to come up. So basically, this started off to be ten common mistakes made by ECMO programs, but it ended up being more like 16. So I took the 10 off, Joe, <laughs> because, uh, and I could have probably done a, a few more. So I talked to a lot of people about this. This is largely my experience, but I also talked to physicians at our hospital and other places, very experienced people. And I asked them, you know, what do you think mistakes are of, 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 of new ECMO programs? And I got some feedback, but this was one that, uh, that, that you definitely see a lot. And that is, a lack of a multi multidisciplinary involvement or inclusion. And, you know, if your ECMO rounds look, look like this, okay, they should look a lot more like this. Like Dr. Samir was saying, he has the nutrition people involved, physical therapy, ECMO specialists, perfusionists, nursing, the intensivists, and, and, and then the, the, the surgeon. We also have, you know, hematology, pulmonology, we have multi-involvement multi every day, not just once every week during grand rounds or whatever, but every day there's, a, there's many eyes on this patient, and um, a lot of places don't do that, and they just kind of think they can set it and forget it. Well, the ECMO is going to buy the patient time. Well, that's, that's really a very uh, narrow way of looking at it, because if you're not on top of these patients, every, every shift, every hour of their care, you're going to find yourself having having a lot less success. So that was number one. Number two is there's places that basically don't have a structured decision-making algorithm and don't even have protocols, by the way, uh, as to how to handle their, their ECMO and, and for sure not even the COVID patients. And so just to, for people listening and people watching, there's, this is, gives you a good running start. If you've not heard of these or you're not using these, these, this gives you a good running start on establishing some type of protocols and algorithms on your decision making for putting a patient on ECMO. And there's something called the Murray score, the REST score, the SAVE score, okay? And then also decision uh, al algorithms. And also weighing the absolute and relative contraindications. None of these things 
are standalone decision makers. You have to include them in with all the other aspects of the patient's care and the expertise. And for new, new places and experienced places, and I think even the experienced places do this, they always have someone they look up to that's an expert or with more experience they call and just you know, run things by them and double check. I'm sure all excellent physicians have colleagues that they confide in where they trained or people they've worked with in the past. So these are some of the things that can give some newer programs a running start. I'm gonna talk about each one of these a little bit. So in the Murray score, it's a score for acute lung injury and it stratifies the severity of acute lung injury, but it's gotta be used with other clinical factors to help select patients for ECMO. And it basically has a range from zero to four. And there is no app for this that I know of, but you go to mdcalc.com and um, you'll, you'll see what, what comes up is a simple series of questions. You have to answer questions about the patient. You know, how much is the consolidation? How much PEEP they're on? What is the PAO2, FIO2 ratio? There's a compliance uh, calculation you can do there with tidal volume divided by PIP minus PEEP. And I just randomly did this, Joe, in making this uh, lecture. I said, let me just go through and just select whatever looked good. I had no target in mind. And so it kind of highlighted those ones that I selected. And this happened to generate a Murray score of 2.3. And basically it comes up and tells you, the website tells you it's mild to moderate lung injury and a patient really is not eligible for ECMO. So according to the uh, ELSO guidelines with Murray score, patients with ARDS and a Murray score of three to four may be considered for ECMO cannulation in the correct clinical setting. Now, if you're a hospital who does not do ECMO and you do a Murray score on somebody and that Murray score is greater than two, that's a good time for you to be considering to transfer that patient to a center with ECMO capabilities. So if that patient gets much worse, they're gonna be uh, perhaps needing ECMO. Okay, so it's also, of course, important to consider all the other patient factors as well as the contraindications and risks for the ECMO. So what about um, ECMO algorithms? So an ECMO algorithm, did I skip something here? No, okay, just making sure. So you need to have an ECMO al algorithm. It's gonna highlight the basic considerations for the types of ECMO cannulation strategies based on different pathophysiologic indications. And this next slide, Joe, you've used it in previous lectures, I think I have, come straight out of the ELSO Red Book, fifth edition. And it looks like this. So there's a lot of ECMO algorithms out there, but if you wanted to get a good start on your ECMO program, and a lot of people just use this, print it out, you know, laminate it, put it right on your ECMO uh, devices, and you can start off with um, refractory hypoxemia, and if the Murray score is three to four, like I just said, and then you have to look at the patient if they have cardiogenic shock or not, and Joe, I know you like this topic a lot because if the patient does not have cardiogenic shock, you can go straight down to venoveno veno, ECMO. And if they have cardiogenic shock, you can look at other heart failure, whether it's due to hypoxemia, if that brings you back over to veno venous, or you need to have VA uh, ECMO. And on the refractory hypercarbia side, either it's with hypoxemia or without, and if basically it's without hypoxemia, you're gonna end up with something called ECOR, which is really low flow V venous ECMO. So this is a pretty simple algorithm for people to follow, and uh, it, is, it is the one backed by, by ELSO. So, um, now there's something else called the REST score, Respiratory ECMO Survival Prediction Score. Okay, and this score was developed by ELSO in conjunction with the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. It's designed to assist prediction of survival for adult ECMO patients undergoing ECMO oxygenation for respiratory failure. So in other words, you're gonna put a patient on ECMO and you're gonna to wanna to know what is the likelihood that this patient is gonna survive. So this is gonna help you tell you, you know, are you doing it way too late? Is this appropriate or not? But it should not be considered for patients who are not on ECMO or as a substitute for clinical assessment. The REST score ranges from a minus eight to a plus eight. And you can go to restscore.com to get this uh, evaluation. And basically, it's similar to the uh, Murray score, but you answer a series of questions, the patient's age, how long they've been on the vent, uh, what type of acute respiratory diagnosis they have, and a series of other questions that are yes and no, immunocompromised, are they on nitric oxide, are they on a bicarb infusion, and you can see the different ones there. And again, Joe, I randomly uh, answered some, and basically, if you come up with a rest score of zero, you have a 50% survival uh, of that patient surviving on ECMO. 
And you can see on the positive numbers would take you much higher and the negative numbers would take you lower. So this is a big one, of course, and you guys have hit on, on this already, waiting too long to initiate ECMO. And this is where I come up with the SAVE score. This is can also can help you with that. So the SAVE score is survival after venoarterial ECMO. Again, you would go to the website, save-score.com. I think I left the S off there. Predicts, predicts in-hospital survival in adult patients after VA ECMO. For This is for cardiogenic shock, though. The others were for respiratory failure. Again, you answer some basic questions. Uh, age, weight, etiology of the cardiogenic shock the renal uh, level of, of acute renal failure or chronic, some of the respiratory status of the patient, some cardio, cardiogenic uh, questions, and then if they're in liver failure or if there's been CNS dysfunction. Now, on this one, I randomly selected. I didn't do any targeting. I just said, let me try this, see what sounds good. And I went through and I just answered some certain things to see what the score would be. And the score comes up of a minus for SAVE score, which is a class three risk class, and that would give you a 42% in hospital survival. Then I went back to it and I changed one thing. You see the red there, number five, respiratory. The initial one I circled, intubation time in hours was 11 hours to 29 hours. You know, it's not very long actually, right? 11 to 29 hours. And if you just bump that up to, to greater than 30 or 30 or greater than 30, it changes yours from a minus six SAVE score a class score and only a 30% in hospital survival uh, rate down from 42%. So if you had somebody on this particular case intubated for 24 hours, and then you just wait six or seven hours longer, this drops 25% decrease in your in hospital survival rate. So uh, for, uh, for, for cardiogenic uh, VA ECMO. So here's another thing that I saw a lot too, Joe, was uh, poor cannula selection, and, and placement. Now we could do a whole hours on this, and we have, I think, done some perf webs on this, so I'm not gonna do that, but what I wanna advise the perfusionist listening is, you know, you have to know your cannulas. You cannot rely on your surgeon to know everything all the time. This is your, this is your baby. You should know your cannulas, what your pressure drops are with certain French sizes, or at least ballpark, and what your flow capability is. If somebody ask you, surgeon says, you know, I'm gonna put a 15 French in, are we gonna be able to flow? Well, you should kinda of know, you know, where that's gonna be. Well, well, how much better am I gonna be if I go up to a 17 French? So, one thing that's interesting here is, if you notice the venous pressures on the right and the arterials on the left, the venous, a pressure drop is a pressure drop, whether or not you're positively pushing it or you're negatively pulling it. The difference in the venous and the arterial, though, is the venous canyons are a little bit longer generally, right? So you're gonna have more resistance because of the length. But if you look back here, I'm gonna go back to the first slide. So if you have uh, a, a 15 French arterial cannula, you can flow three liters a minute and have 100 a millimeter of pressure drop. If you jump up to a 17 French, you can have a four liter, which is usually 4.2 if you look under close, uh, flow through a 17 French. And if you jump up to a 19 French, it goes all the way up to five and a half. And just as a rule of thumb, in case you ever wondered, I can't, I can't memorize all this for every cannula, right? It's about a 35% improvement for every two French sizes you jump up. If you take three liters at a 15 French and you get 35% higher, you'll be at about 4.2 on a 17 French. If you take 35% on top of 4.2, you'll be at about 5.4. So just to give you a general idea, if you have a certain cannula in a patient, and the surgeon asks you, how much better am I gonna be if I go up to this? Generally, it's gonna be about a 35% improvement, just so that you can calculate on your own. But one last thing I wanna point out, manufacturers do not test their cannulas with blood. They test their cannulas with water. So even what I'm showing you right here is a, is a manufacturer's insert on how their cannula performs, but it's tested with water, not with blood. So here we have uh, one example of placement. And I was talking about, we do a lot of right uh, IJ, right um, femoral vein for our COVID. And this is this, is this particular uh, setup. And as you can see there, you're really having a high, high likelihood of mixing if you have the venous cannula too close to the return cannula there in the atrium. 
So um, you really should position that venous cannula at the junction of the IVC and the right atrium and try to aim as much as you can that right IJ down into the right atrium. But just looking at this, I wanted to show you guys something, because this actually happened three days ago, Joe. I couldn't believe this. So are you guys able to hit the play button on this video? This is a femoral venous cannula. Look at the line and see if you can see what's going on. Look at that. See what's happening? I actually videoed that three days ago. That's an actual patient that has a femoral vein, right? That's his right leg. And we had a very inefficient right IJ, right femoral vein, VV cannulation. We took him back to the OR. And you know what we did? We put a protect in. <laughs> but in gotcha. actuality, we also pulled this femoral cannula way back. And that actually did improve some things to a certain extent. But he actually needed it. Uh, more than that anyway, because he had right right sided failure. So that's pretty impressive. But this is what can happen when you have poor placement of cannula and you're not monitoring your venous mixing with some, you know, astuteness of your SVO2 on your line or maybe even the ELSA monitor or what have you. You see that? It's sucking right back the arterial return blood. So let's see if we can. So here's a big one, of course, that you see. Uh, that I would see out there. This I saw a lot. Now, I'm not a pulmonologist. I'm not even a respiratory therapist. So I'm going to give you the uh, best I can. The guys here can probably add a lot to this. Mismanagement of the ventilator. And when I say that, I'm talking about on, on ECMO, on, on, on BV ECMO mostly. So just so people can understand, there's something out there called VILI, ventilator-induced lung injury. And there's four basic types of lung injury that, that, that you have out there. And one of them is Adelect trauma, right? This is the shear stress caused by, just by the opening and closing of the alveoli. And if you want to look into this deeper, you can look, in something called, look into something called the hysteresis curve for lung compliance. And what this is, is the difference between the inspiratory and expiratory compliance of the alveoli. So it means that the lung volume at any given pressure during inhalation is less than the lung volume at any given pressure during exhalation. There's something called barotrauma. This is elevated transpulmonary pressures. And if they're greater than 30, is usually when you get very concerned. But um, transpulmonary pr uh, pressure is the difference between the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure in the pleural cavity. And I had a good question. Maybe, doctor, you guys can answer this. What is the pressure in the pleural cavity? Would you have a, a good idea of what it is? So in a, in a regular person, the way we inhale is by generating negative pressure. Right. So the best way, obviously, putting a catheter in the pleura is the ideal way to do it. But the downside of it is if the parenchyma is normal, there is no effusion. Because um, just by the practical aspect, the lung is going to rub against it yeah. and you will get a false reading. So in a clinical setting or in, in a physiological way, if you want to measure it, people end up doing an esophageal probe. Yeah. That's the best way to know what your pleural pressures are doing. Now the next question comes down to, what is it? If you are under positive pressure, that's a whole mm -hmm. other different story because it's, that's not physiological, right. how to do it. So roughly, yes, the pleural pressure you can calculate by using esophageal probe. There was actually an excellent study which answered this question in ARDS where people controlled the ventilator setting and mean airway pressure based on the esophageal pressure and the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't show any difference. Mm -hmm by doing usual clinical judgment to again, because it's, it's not exactly like a balloon inside a box. That's not how lung works. It's a lot more complex right. structure. So I guess my, my, my question was, if, if, if for people who are out there listening, thinking about this, if your pleural cavity pressure is basically very, very low and even negative, and so if you have a positive 30 intra-alveolar pressure, and you have a negative on the other side, that delta becomes much very Obviously large. higher, yes. So it's right. not as though we have a, a relatively you know, significant positive pressure at all in the plural. Absolutely. So that way, a positive 30 <coughs> delta across the lung is, can be can quite yeah, dramatic. Yeah, the transpulmonary pressures, as you again um, rightly pointed out, what are the different settings? Was the patient paralyzed or not? Did you take out your thoracic compliance? Is he coughing? Is he agitated? All those things will make your pressure, like you and me, when we cough, we generate intense mm -hmm. positive pressure inside our airway mm -hmm. because that's physiological. That's how you want to expectorate your secretion. Mm -hmm. So similar to that. And why does it matter so much? Is it's like putting it in a balloon. It's going to rupture. So we are doing such high pressure. 
you develop institutional um, air leak, and there you go. You get a pneumomidastinum and pneumomidastinum and everything else because a lot of people miss out pleural effusion. Uh, sorry, pneumothorax doesn't happen because you have an obvious rupture in the lung. No, that's not how it is. Somewhere in the institutional, mm-hmm. then the alveoli, the air starts creeping into the institutional and it just spreads and leaks out. And so this is a big cause of your pneumothoraxes, your, your uh, pneumomidastinum, and your subcutaneous so, air. Correct? Absolutely. Okay. So then we also have biotrauma, which is largely uh, something that's going to happen. Uh, due mostly to the inflammatory cascade. And then we have volutrauma. And this is when you get into over-distension of the alveoli, correct? Which is mostly due to overextension of volume, too high of tidal volumes, I guess, right? So there's a lung protective mechanical ventilation strategy or target. Now, this is reserved for ECMO. It's not settings that you would put a patient on generally outside of ECMO, okay? So the whole point of ECMO, especially with BV, is so we can turn these vent settings down to rest settings and allow the lungs to recover. Now, Joe, when I was out there, I saw very aggressive and high vent settings, even though we had the ECMO on. I saw patients where the ECMO was on 70% and the ventilator was on 80%. Makes no sense. I mean, so we're gonna talk about this. So so something called a plateau pressure, which you should try to keep less than 25, and this is sort of your for people who don't know, your end inspiratory pressure. You also have your respiratory rate. You should try to set that somewhere between four to 10, just so you know, for reference, normal is somewhere between 12 and 20, for a normal person healthy. PEEP, you should try to set somewhere between five and 10. Now, there's a lot of things that go into PEEP, but just so people know, your normal PEEP would somewhere be around three to five, but that's a little bit uh, debatable as well. And then dr- driving pressure, you wanna keep that Less than 15. Driving pressure is your plateau pressure minus your peak. You also want to keep your FiO2, if you can, less than 50%. So long as you're maintaining SpO2 of somewhere in the, in the mid-80s at least. Most people get nervous if it starts getting below, below 85, 80. And then your tidal volumes, usually you try to set down to 4 to 6 mill- milliliters per kilogram. I think one of you guys brought that up in your talk. And normal for most people, just so you have a, 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 a comparison, is six to eight. So you're setting your tidal volumes a little bit lower, but this is very heavily dependent on the lung compliance, which almost all of our patients are going to have big issues with lung compliance. And then you want to avoid dyssynchronies. Dyssynchronies is fighting the ventilator. And when this happens, you may need to uh, look into some sedation. And there's a, a big reason why I brought all this up. Sedation and paralytic. Yeah, we're going to talk about that because that was a big issue that I ran into too. So just for people's reference, if you want to know the, the, the NIH ARDS protocol, you can go to the ARDSnet. It's too difficult to put on the screen because it looks like this, but it's going to tell you ways to incre- incrementally increase FiO2 versus PEEP, sometimes PEEP versus FiO2, and all the other there's inclusion criteria and different things on here as well. So here's something I run into, Joe, and this is an interesting one that uh, I know we've had a lot of talks about this, as I run into this where the patients, uh, they do not maintain even a normal colloidosmotic pressure or protein levels on the patients. So just for people's reference, a normal range for albumin is 3.4 to 5.4. Normal range for total protein is 6 to 8.3. And the normal colloid osmotic pressure is somewhere between 22 and 28. The reason I bring this up is this is something that I encounter. We, we all, we all, we all, we all um, try to fight this in normal ECMO anyway because patients are predisposed to, to third spacing anyway due to the inflammatory response and so on. But what you're going to see your patients that look like the hand on the left versus the hand on the right, when you see that, that's not just in their periphery. If you have peripheral edema, this is going to be usually a global edema. So you're having all types of organ edema as well, which is going to lead to, you know, organ dysfunction. Well, so may, do- may I say something real quick? Sure. So there, there's a, I can't remember who said this. I read it in some article somewhere. But anasarca is not simply a visually displeasing finding. If you look like, 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 the Michelin man or, or a water balloon outside, that is all of the organs as well. Gut edema, cardiac edema, pulmonary edema, liver edema, right. kidney, renal kidney edema. It's horrible. 
So there are all these perfusion deficits occur as a result of it. Your end organ, your parenchyma is not getting appropriate perfusion. You're, you're, you're reading my mind of the next three or four seconds. Oh, sorry. So perfectly good. No, <laughs> but, but, no, but, no, but, no, but your comment's great, and I appreciate it. So, you know, what happens, so edema it reduces the plasma volume because it goes from intravascular to extravascular, and this causes compression of the capillaries, which is going to reduce tissue perfusion, increase your lactates, and all the other re reduction in tissue perfusion that goes along with it. But one of the things you can point to is it decreases blood circulation, and the legs can cause deep, deep vein thrombosis, which you all know can lead to pulmonary embolus. So, anasarca, there you go, Joe. So, just talking about regular edema, but the reason I brought up about anasarca is this is a whole body, far more extreme than regular edema. It's a severe and generalized form of edema, but it's often caused by decrease in alcotic pressure. Because remember, that this particular uh, item that I'm addressing is people not maintaining normal protein albumin levels and colloid and osmotic pressure. So this is highlighted as one of the big causes of anasarca. The causes also are varied, though. It can cause by a number of things, right side failure, kidney failure, liver failure, protein losing enteropathies. But again, severe protein deficiency is one of the big causes of anasarca. Now, you also have to not, uh, no conversation is complete without saying you have to always think about capillary leak syndrome in these cases, right? So if you have capillary leak syndrome and your protein is, uh, you know, diffusing out into the tissues, now, if that continues to happen and you give albumin, you could actually make the situation worse. So this, this is where we have debate and conversation about, you know, giving patients albumin. So also, Joe, we talk about keeping the cos osmotic pressure too low and people that give all this fluid, right? One of the big causes of anasarca, administration, over-administration of exogenous intravenous fluid. So I highlighted certain ones because these are heavily perfusion-related things that we could do in the OR. We can give way too much fluid, we cannot give albumin, we cannot hemoconcentrate, and we can do things that are going to aggravate, maybe not cause anasarca, which I'm sure we have, but we definitely see patients in the ICU that are four, five, ten pounds overweight, and it's all fluid volume. So here's a big one now, and you know, I'm not a, a critical care medicine physician, but I'll tell you what I know and what I could learn, which, but I saw this extensive periods of paral paralyzation and sedation, and I went to a place Joe, where they had 0% success COVID patients, and every single patient was completely sedated and paralyzed for weeks and months at a time. And this was so different than a lot of things that I'm seeing. And a lot of this, what I'm talking about, is in direct contrast to the things that we see at our center. And I'm saying our center is right, but I'm saying these are things that I, that I saw. So what can we try to learn from this? This is uh, extensive periods of paralyzation and sedation. So, Clinicians in, in, in recent years have trended away from heavy sedation. It's not totally true, though, uh, which is generally associated with cardiovascular complications, delirium, increased difficulty weaning patients, of course, from mechanical ventilation. But prolonged sedation leads to muscle loss, which is a real big one. It also is going to lead to prolonged ventilation, poor circulation complications, and lengthy rehabilitation. There's a, there's a formula, and you guys could probably tell me, for every uh, one day of sedation is three days of rehabilitation. Is that correct? Yeah, but, muscle rehabilitation. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I'm going to be, I have to tell you, I'm not sure if that applies in our current situation with mm -hmm. COVID-19. You've got to do what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got to stay paralyzed, well, and then it is, I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. And if it's going to be extensive periods, it's just the nature of the disease. Uh, we have to deal with it. Actually, I, I actually looked into that, and with the COVID patients, we are having to sedate and paralyze our patients far more than we ever did before. That's actually true. Well, if you have, I think it just depends. Again, if you have a patient who you can keep comfortable, which we'll say precedence, and they're not thrashing about, mm -hmm. I think that's one set of patients. And I think we keep trying to create this, this one-size-fits-all sock. If you have a patient that has sufficient lung reserve, you don't have to beat them up at the vent and you can keep them comfortable and you can sort of let them be awake, but like not paralyzed, that's great. But if they are, you know, 
non-compliant or they are rigid, stiff, fighting, you know, and you're having a problem ventilating them or they have almost no pulmonary reserve at all, they, they aren't contributing, it's all ECMO, you're probably going to be having to handle that patient differently. Yeah, again, I mean, we all are talking about the same thing, essentially, it's the priorities of less. So if somebody you're trying to set it and everything, the short-term priority, which I would as a clinician, why am I doing it? Oh, I need the oxygenation better. Yeah. And what are the different ways? Yes, I have stabilized the delivery. There's a certain amount of um, oxygen I'm delivering to the lungs. The next aspect is how can I decrease the demand? And one of the things he's sedating and paralysis, that's where it comes down to. You're decreasing the demand, what the body is going to burn and try to conserve the vital organs, which is the brain and the kidneys and the heart, where you're giving it. Again, would I do it at day 14? Then probably you need to start thinking about, okay, I've done it for 14 days and it's still not working. Maybe the primary issue is not going away. So obviously that's where you run into all the issues. I think Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring up a strategy that I was told, and there is probably many with with sedation, paralyzation, using it and coming back off of it. But with the COVID patients, the inflammation and irritation of the lungs has caused far more dyssynchronies with the ventilator than we've ever had. So what Dr. Samir was saying, we're having to, we're having to do this way more than I think we ever did before. And, um, for, so for patients with, with the synchronies, the first effort, and this is one may, way of doing it, is incremental increases in sedation until you can finally get, hopefully, to a deep sedation. If that fails, though, and you, your deep sedation is still desynchronous with the vent, then I think paralyzation uh, is something that... Uh, well, I'm going to have to I disagree with this statement yeah. strongly, and I'm going to tell you, when Soma and I are paralyzing people... We're not paralyzing them because they're trashing or cannot sedate them. We're paralyzing for pulmonary mechanics. Yes. That's what we're paralyzing for, pulmonary mechanics. And that you cannot achieve whatever sedation you want to use. And, uh, you know, sometimes I get the nurse telling me, well, the patient's not moving around. Why do we paralyze them? Well, I'm not paralyzing because they're not moving. Mm-hmm. I'm paralyzing for pulmonary mechanics. This is a very important concept people have to understand. We're not paralyzing because people are trashing around. They can trash what they want. It's okay with me. But pulmonary <laughs> mechanics is the most important thing to achieve New to pulmonary mechanics, I, can, I, I want to manage them. I want to manipulate the pulmonary mechanics myself. I cannot manage pulmonary mechanics when the patient has his own mechanics going on. We had the concept of auto peep, which is a very difficult concept. And I have to tell you, I just had to review two deaths related to auto peep that happened in front of me. And auto peep is a very bad thing, you know what I'm saying? And when someone have auto peep to the point that we have to disconnect the vent to let the auto peep run, that's a bad thing because I'm letting also uh, all the, what, what the efforts I've done well, you know, go away. So I have to say, paralysis is not for sedation. Paralysis is pulmonary mechanic only. And people don't understand don't get that. That's a problem for me. I'm not paralyzing because the patient cannot uh, be sedated properly. I'm paralyzing to neutralize pulmonary mechanic. Right. So and you're I mean, sedating I, them so they're not paralyzed and awake. Well, that is a con- that's, that's that is a standard, sir. Oh, well, I can tell that you that, standard, that at our center, we paralyze very, very few. We do sedation, and we don't have dyssynchronies with the vent. Now, when you do, we paralyze. Now, I know a center who is very, very prominent, who takes patients from the beginning, they 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, paralyze the patient, get them oxygenated, start reversing the downward trend of hypoxemia, then start bringing them back off of that and see if they don't fight the vent. So I'm saying there is many ways. In fact, this is the, um, the next one I put up there. Eliminating the ventilator dyssynchronies in the first 48 to 72 hours, when you, when you can eliminate those asynchronies, which if you have to do paralyzation, you do, allows for you to draw an opportunity of three days or so, diuresis and or CRT to dry out the lungs and correct and get ahead of the hypoxemia. Because if you're having to put the patient on ECMO and heavily ventilator, hypoxemia is probably a very serious issue, right? So unless you get ahead of that, you're going nowhere fast regardless, right? So, uh, so as the lungs improve, then you can try to hopefully decrease your paralysis and sedation should follow. I'm not a pulmonologist. This is all advice, recommendations from people that I uh, spoke to. So this is something else I see, Joe. Tremendous bed sores. They paralyze the patient, deep sedation. They don't turn the bed. Forget about taking the patient and get him, uh, sitting him up like you were talking about, Serena. We do that all the time. We take him, we put him in the chair, even if it's in a lift. That amount is tremendous improvements for us. Even if you can get the patient to sit up and they can't do a whole lot, you'd be amazed at how much of what you were talking about. You're already changing your VQ mismatches and things get a whole bunch of things that I don't even know if we fully understand. Benefits seem to emerge 
Uh, but bringing the patients up, and even if we can get them up and into the chair. I go to places, they don't even have a chair in the room. They say it's not big enough, or whatever the reason. So, but all nurses know, and nursing care would know, that you know, even just offloading a patient 10 degrees reduces the incidence of pressure wounds by 70%. And a lot of times you're going to do more than 10, more 20 and 30 degrees, right? And I think you were saying if you can't prone, you want to go even you know, as high as possible. And even this has a lot of benefits similar to proning, but not as extreme. But you still have the, 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 the relationship is there, you know, for, for the, the improvement, not only for, for bed sores. So um, failure to turn or angle the patients. The aims of repositioning are to reduce and relieve pressure on the area at risk, maintain muscle mass and general tissue integrity, ensure adequate blood supply to the risk areas. Patients who are bed bound should be turned every two hours. I think this is a, a nursing uh, protocol. Keeps blood flowing to their skin, prevents bed chores, and will keep them more comfortable. I mean, Serena and you guys, you think that around the clock you see pa patients, even in the night shift, turn the patients every two hours? Is yes, that, even it does in the happen. night shift. I did work night, so I can report yeah. that yes. Our and I, was told that, I was told that as well, exactly. Uh, I went to a place, they didn't have any wedges. They said, what's a wedge? I said, you ever put your patients up on a wedge? We don't, we don't have wedges in our unit. They make them with pillows. That's yeah, it. yeah, they do yeah. pillows. I know. Yeah, they do. They do. Well, this but is a place. Anything, this is a place that I've never blanket up. Do yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but if you don't move your patients, and I mean, just sometimes moving them around, right. Especially yeah. if they have a lot of, you know, if they have like pneumonia and stuff. They have, they have any kind of pleural effusions. You're moving it around, and you're sort of helping it, you know, clear over time. The, the list of benefits. Just moving is, it around is helps. Long list of benefits. Yeah, there, mm -hmm. there really is. Um, this is something I see all the time. Joe, at your hospitals, you do ECMO here. Oh my God. I walk into the room and I see the heater turned on 36.3, 36.5, 36. A lot of people have it as their protocol. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but if the patient, they have the, they have the bear hugger on the patient, they have blankets on them, and the heater is at 36.6, the patient's cold. In my opinion, patients should never be cold or hot on ECMO. We have control of the core temperature. So as perfusionists, you go into the room and the nurse is covering the patients, freezing, turn the temperature up the room, bear hugger, and you have the thing at 36.3, you're wondering why the patient's cold. You know what I mean? And I, 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 I'm so glad you brought this up. This is very good. And I'd like to get the panel's opinion about this, all, all of everyone involved. So I was at a place, um, I won't say where, clearly, and um, they had a heater cooler, which was turned off. The patient's saturation was... 82 percent, um, and it had been falling. Their temperature was, and this was at max settings on everything. The ECMO was at 100. The vent was still at 100. And their temperature was 101.4. So I was like, you know, I mean, there's not a lot I could do for flow, but, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and turn this heater cooler on and cool this patient mm -hmm. down to a more normal temperature. That's what I'm planning on doing. And they almost had a stroke. Right. And they said, what, 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 you can't do that. You're, you're, you're never supposed to cool a febrile patient. And I said, look, this, this, is, this, is, this is a different scenario here. If we leave this patient in an oxygen deficit long enough, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to have to worry too much about why yeah. they have the fever. I think we need to cool them down. But they overruled me and the department that was the person in charge of that department at that time, because I was there as a, as a, as a, as a, a, a supplemental staff, um, overruled me and said, absolutely not. You're not allowed to cool this patient down. I thought that was pretty naive, but that's, you know, what I understand. I certainly understand, you know, medical school 101, temperatures help clear the infection. I get all of that, but I think we're dealing well, with a different animal. That's here. interesting. Soma, I'd like to hear their thoughts because everywhere I've ever gone, even the patients are, I'm talking ECMO patients now. Sept septic, getting hot. We, 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 everywhere yes. I've been, they've cooled them. But yes. I this, have thought of that aspect. This place of it, did not. So, Dr. Soma, so, let's just I mean, go is around. Is that right or table. wrong? Oh, it's, it's a very fascinating. I think uh, maybe I've become senior now. That's why I <laughs> tell people, you know what? There is a reason they teach you physiology in med school. And that's mm -hmm. how do you produce your heat? The major source of heat in a body is your muscle. Muscles, right. And how does the muscle produce your heat? Is by burning glucose and oxygen. So if you're at a higher temperature, yes, febrile response is a very conserved evolutionary mechanism to combat infections because if you're at a higher temperature, it makes the proliferation of the bacteria different because 
Mm. At the end of the day, it's a chemical system. You need to have an optimal pH and an optimal temperature for all your enzymes and everything else to work. And that is the reason the body, uh, evolutionarily, a febrile response happens. So downside of it, especially if you're talking, somebody, as Joe was saying, already on 100% um, vent support, 100% FiO2 on a vent and 100% ECMO support, the only way I can bring down, same thing, oxygen demand, mm -hmm is by cooling the patient so you're not burning so many, um, um, whatever little bit of oxygen, oxygen is trickling around, you're not burning it out. Maybe potentially you can actually induce a vasoconstriction, again the same thing, conserve the blood supply away from the skin, away from the muscles, and you're trying to put it more so that more is available for the brain and the kidney and everything, but that is the name of the game essentially out here is how can I protect the vital organs. It's, it's basic physiology essentially. I'm not sure why people want to run at 100 degrees. I have no yeah. idea. Okay. You yeah, should spare. control your temperature. Uh, the, the, the brain likes cool temperature. That's all I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's you think a, that's, that's a different point. context. Yeah. 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 That's the yeah. injury yeah. and, yeah. and, so and so how is your... Uh, I, I, this I think about it. Oh, being, uh, running hot, I mean... Yeah, that's, that's so 101.4, really you disagree. You think Absolutely. that I should, you should cool the patient. John, you think that... Gil? You should, for sure, you should have called the patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to get the metabolic rate down. I you didn't. Guys. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but, it, you know, it would have you, but that was... I was overruled. Yeah. I mean, again, same thing. If you look at the why does a normal human being, you go to Antarctica and this thing, why do we shiver? One, yeah, we have to, because we are ectotherms. We right. lose heat. Right. So when we shiver, we actually get our muscles, we produce more heat. Why does the, the skin get more drier and everything else? Why do we develop frostbite? Because that is a physiological response because skin is a major organ. That's where you lose majority of the heat. The body says, I'm going to decrease the blood supply mm -hmm. for it. So vasoconstriction happens. Go to an extreme, you get frostbites because mm -hmm. that's essentially what you're doing. So you're essentially mimicking what the, the body actually has a natural mechanism to realize what I need to do is decrease my heat loss because what I'm producing or I don't have enough energy to produce so that I can combat somebody living at a sub-zero temperature. Mm -hmm. So that's the simple extrapolation which you can do in this case. I know ECMO centers, their, their protocol set the heater at 36.5. Blanket every patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general, people are going to be cold if, if you do that. And mm -hmm. might be an occasional person that, that mm -hmm. fits. And, and that's the same um, um, example why in, in strokes, why we start doing a hypothermia is right. if there is limited blood supply, what is the issue is you have that zone similar to in myocardial infarction. Yes. Certain part of the brain is completely gone. Then you have a surrounding zone which is partially supplied by blood. Mm -hmm. Now by decreasing the temperature, you're decreasing the metabolic needs so that it survives and it doesn't get further damage. Right. You don't have extension role, of the, right. you're reducing yes, yes. extension of the injury. Is that's right. Doing. That's the, the whole idea behind cooling. hypothermia, why it came into right. uh, place. Let's see, I take it a step. Serena, what's your thoughts? So from a nursing standpoint, you definitely want to get that fever down. You cannot keep it that high. Yeah. And you might not want to tell your doctor that you kept it that high all night. Because that would be the first question. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're where I was. Right. That's a Which different I've never story. Heard. Okay. So, Joe, imagine the experience that you had in multiplying that times 12, 15, 20 places when you go places and you see these things that are just in yeah. direct contradiction to everything you thought you knew. <laughs> yeah. But I want to so. take this just one step further. I'm going to start with you, Serena, and come back around. Is I will go farther than that. If I have a patient who we're having trouble oxygenating. And of course, I'm not happy with a saturation of 82. I know some people are, I'm not. Um, I want it to be 95 or better. That's, I think DO2 is so critically important to these patients. Um, if they're sedated, they're paralyzed, still having problems getting their DO2 up, I'll cool them down to 36 and be very comfortable with that. And that way I can decrease that oxygen demand and my delivery deficit is compensated Absolutely. for what say you so i do have a neuro background so cooling for me i understand and i'm okay with that because mm -hmm. i've seen it work but in a patient so. that's not a neuro patient this you is not a neuro neurological have to do what you have to do to decrease that demand okay so. gil i agree you got to bring the temperature down we leave the temperature so up. you're comfortable taking a patient right. put it at 36 just simply mm -hmm. to reduce metabolic demand yeah absolutely john Okay. Yeah, I think you guys. So this is one that oh. we had when, years ago, several years ago when I started. We had purple fingers and toes seemingly way too much. And, um, you know, Joe, we've done several perf webs on neosinephrine, and I'm not a fan of it at all. 
But it's come to where we almost never use it in our unit at all anymore. But you go out there and you see this, and of course, this is what you see. Um, and for anybody listening who may not know, you know, phenylephrine is strictly an alpha-1 vasoconstrictor. And, and worse than that, it's a precapillary vasoconstrictor, right? I mean, if, if, if you even use phenylephrine to increase your blood pressure, and there's an application for it. And phenylephrine is an application for anesthesia or shock or hypertension due to anesthesia or shock. There's an application for it. But just keep in mind that it is a precapillary vasoconstrictor largely, and you can easily have tissue edema. So for, for people out there, and, and Serena, you could probably elaborate more than I could on this, but there are, there are other first choice alternatives. So at our institution, in many places I go, you'll see them using levofed, dopamine, uh, vasopressin. And then if you have all these going and you need a touch of neosinephrine, then it comes in. But if you have it as one of your major frontline vasoconstrictors, we saw a huge drop off in this type of thing when we went to using it only as the very last additive in addition to these other things that were already running. I may have left one or two well, off. No, to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know so many things. Dopamine is not in my book, will never be ever. Yeah. And uh, Neo is not my book either. I like so, the I like so, the uh, Well, that's for cardiac support. Right. So we're talking yeah, about but I think it's good for okay, so, uh, so I, like so I, I think like the only alternative you have is Lebo Vaso and Gipresa to supplement the right. so, uh, situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So the reason I had to put an asterisk by Gipresa is it's supposedly $50,000 a dose. <laughs> or something. A lot of centers that might not have that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what uh -huh. But yes, I think. Yeah, but that's just a little bit more than a Protect Duo cannula. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they really, they just throw those away. I mean, some people would throw in Epi, which is really not, you know, but uh, so, so yeah, I mean, there's a those list of things. But at least people, new ECMO program listeners out there can say, look, we have a lot of things we can use long before we start just putting on a, a, a phenylephrine group. So this is one I think you guys started to talk about a minute ago with the decreased narcotic output. I ran into centers that had, you know, patients that basically were in severe hypodynamic, you know, 15 cardiac output, and the VV ECMO is running at four and a half. Yeah. And they're wondering why, you know, they can't oxygenate the patient. And I said, you guys, you really, so what's the cardiac output? And you can see the thing there, it showed 15 liters. And I said, well, you do realize that you're only capturing, you know, less than a third of the V. Well, what do you mean but, by but that? Wait a minute. How is that cardiac output being read? Because, of course, that's going to really depend, you know. You're, if, you when have you have, a, if you have when, a swan in with the uh, when you're flow a, track or whatever, it, it shows you pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be. But even it's if it's not 100 percent accurate, the part, yeah. If it's not 100 percent accurate, the bottom line is you have a hyperdynamic patient because mm -hmm. they're septic, what have you, and you're only flowing less than you know 25, 30 percent of that on the VV ECMO. And you're wondering why you're hypoxic. I've ran into places that, and I'm going to go back now. I think the only way to really know the only way. Could, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That you that you could give a patient a beta blocker and asmol basically yeah. is what I think is most people use. Yeah, short, short acting. Short acting to decrease that. And then they decrease it down to, you know, so mm -hmm. just so people understand, you know, beta blockers in general, but Esmolol is used to treat fast heartbeat, high blood pressure, but basically it will slow your, your, your hyperdynamic rate down so that you go from something like at the top there to more like something at the bottom. And now your four and a half liter BV ECMO is exactly. supplying 55% of their, their mm -hmm. control, instead mm -hmm. of 25%, right? Mm -hmm. Failure to understand VA, fem, fem, ECMO, people drawing blood samples from the wrong oh. arm. So we've talked about this in a lot of prefer before, Joe. If you have a femoral arterial cannula, people need to understand you are sending arterialized blood retrograde up the aorta, and it is going to mix with desaturated, oxygenated, desaturated blood coming out of the left ventricle, Somewhere along if the line. If you have pulmonary if, if you failure have pulmonary or you're failure, not right. ventilating the patient. Right. That so, really depends. Right. If you don't have pulmonary failure, then this is not the case. So if you have poor, poor oxygenation, you're almost never going to get that oxygenated blood all the way to the aortic valve. And by the way, people forget the coronary arteries are getting poor perfusion too, not just the head. And to get oxygenated blood all the way to the aortic valve, it'd be pretty challenging without over distension of the left ventricle and so on. So... People can, you could talk about uh, 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 Harlequin syndrome and North-South syndrome and regional hypoxemia. It goes by a lot of names, but you just have to understand that you have to draw your 
your blood gas is from somewhere on your right arm, and that's because that's giving you the indication of your, your earliest, most vessel takeoff to the head. You still may be being hypoxic to your coronary arteries, by the way. That's what. Failure to utilize a distal perfusion cannula or O2 sat monitors on the distal limbs. I, we, when I talked about the hub and spoke model, you have the, the main center, they're probably using all distal perfusion cannula. We, protocol is absolutely standard of care, but we'll do a pack and ship where they send it, it doesn't have the distal perfusion cannula, right? They think, well, you know, it can flow around the cannula and come back down. So, you know, and this is, I'm a big advocate of using the, some type of uh, uh, a, a sat monitor on Mears. your limbs. And you'll see here, like this one here, the two limbs, and one is greatly higher than the other. And this is what can happen when you have one limb that is uh, not have the, the, the arterial cannula in it, and the left would, and you see poor limb perfusion can lead to just horrific complications. If you have a distal limb perfusion catheter in, you can see there, both legs nice and pink. It's gonna send blood down the leg, okay? So you see the uh, red arrow there. You insert five, six, seven French usually uh, catheter down, down to the distal limb, and now you have far, far less uh, complications. In fact, uh, it's, it's, I think, standard of care now to use distal perfusion catheter, but I see a fair amount where that doesn't happen. This I've run into also. Uh, people say it's impossible to take the ECMO patient to a CT scan. Have you run into that? I've been told it's impossible. We can't do it. Can't get the equipment out of the room. Can't get it into the CT scanner. And uh, we just never do it. I'm, I think to myself, well, how are you... You know all the things you're missing by not doing that? And so I bring this one up because I have run into this, and there are so many diagnoses and things. We take our patients to a CT scanner constantly. Okay, we have, we have sometimes patients go multiple times, and any time we, we, we have a, a complication we need to look into, and there's many, but this is some of them. You can look at malposition cannulas, hematomas, stroke, of course, all your cerebral diagnosis, right, with your hemorrhagic and embolic events, pulmonary and abdominal abscesses, abscesses and infections, aortic and stasis and thrombus, he, abdo, abdominal hematomas, retroperitoneal bleeds, and we have our infectious doctor who sends to CT all the time. He can order CT, and you look for abscesses in the abdomen and so on. Inappropriate application of the chest tube. So I worked at a, I went to a place one time, all COVID patients, Every single patient had between one and four chest tubes. None of these were cardiotomy patients. None. They were all COVID patients. So I'm just going to read this for people who don't understand why chest tubes might be. And this came out of perfusiontheory.com, and the author was unknown at the time. I sent them an email asking who the author was, but it actually does have a lot of good information on it. And I'm just going to read this. I apologize. But chest tubes can significantly contribute to complications and respiratory ECMO patients primarily due to bleeding from the chest wall into the chest cavity. One internal chest wound can seriously complicate ECMO efficacy and the need for a second tube amplifies the problem. Non-functional chest tubes should not be removed after initiation of ECMO due to the high risk of internal bleeding. Chest tubes should not be inserted once ECMO has been initiated except in the most dire of circumstances. It's possible to avoid chest tube placement in up to 86% of non-ECMO patients on positive pressure ventilation with occult pneumothoraces. Upon the development of a pneumothorax, consideration should first be given to the ventilator pressure and rate, followed by an increase in ECMO blood flow if needed. If the pneumothorax is not impacting the cardiac or ECMO function, and this is where I think people make the mistake, they see the pneumothorax, they're used to putting in a chest tube, but if it's not impacting the cardiac or ECMO function, it should be closely followed and allowed to passively absorb. Eliminating chest tube insertion would avoid subjecting one in four patients to the risk of major chest tube related insertional, positional, and infective complications. And this is really the big one. The, the, the bleeding complications associated with a heparinized patient on ECMO inserting a chest tube are just massive if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen it. Initiation of VV ECMO, should be seriously considered before chest tube placement is made in respiratory disease patients who develop a new thorax. The choice of chest tube placement versus VV ECMO is a difficult decision, must be based on clinical experience rather than discrete criteria. But the development of a pneumothorax may signify the enhanced fragility of the lungs 
to the aggressive ventilator settings before accepted respiratory ECMO criteria are met. And the need for chest tubes is in itself often an indication for the need of VV ECMO. Multiple chest tubes placed before ECMO can result in serious internal bleeding complications after the patient is heparinized. The situation may also require the need for VA ECMO rather than VV. But people are probably asking themselves, well, wait a second, we put chest tubes in all the time in our cardiotomy, cardi post-cardiotomy patients, and we don't have this problem. And in ECMO patients, the risk, in post-cardiotomy ECMO patients, the risk is much less due to intraoperative placement of the chest strains without intercostal wounds, and the ability to easily reassess the chest should, should a tamponade not occur. So this is why it's such a big difference with cardiotomy patients versus ECMO patients. And this is the last one. So he said it was 10, but I got up to 16, Joe. I can tell you, failure to communicate realistic expectations and outcomes of time frames to the families. I can tell you how many times this has happened. The patient's on ECMO and a family gets off work, family member gets off work three or four o'clock and they show up in the ICU and they stay there from four o'clock to five, 530. And they say, I'm going to go down to the cafeteria for dinner. They come back an hour later. Is he any better? You know, they've been gone an hour. And that tells me that somewhere along the line, there's, there's going to be a disconnect between what we're really doing here and what the family. And I'll tell you another thing that happens. And this is no fault of their own. But let's say the lung has completely whited out. But the next morning is a little bit better. You know, there's a little bit of opacity there that you see. And the nurse or somebody will say to the family member, well, over the phone, you know, well, his x-ray is better. A little better. Well, all they heard was better. You know, 12 hours later, it can be completely whited out again, right? But the family hears that something is better. So they think a lot more than what, what we're actually telling them. And so what I think we need to make sure is that people realize that, you know, we're watching grass grow here a lot of times. We're taking one step in a marathon, and sometimes we may take a lot of backward steps as well. And I'm not sure that that's conveyed, you know, all that well sometimes to family members. So I think that's, uh, I had a bunch of write up here thing, but I'm really just going to leave it to this last one. And basically we need to establish a real good relationship and we need to understand the family's perspective and they need to understand our perspective and it'll help communication between healthcare and the family members. I think that's all I have. Here. Okay. Can you go to slide one before we take a break? Because we're going to need to take a break and we're going to, but I want you to go to your very first slide. First slide? Your very first slide. That's not to go all the way back, right? Yeah, they could have done it for you faster. Oh, okay. That's all right. You just do it. The very first slide? Yeah, your second slide. There you go. Right, That one right there. Okay. There should only be two things. Of all the things that you just went through, all of which were very good, by the way. It was an excellent presentation. Certainly loved it, every part of it. But this slide should be your only slide, <laughs> and it should have one and one, not one and two. Lack of multidisciplinary involvement, inclusion. One, someone in charge. Mm -hmm. There's the biggest problem. You've got 50 chiefs and no Indians. Everybody walks in, it's my patient, I want this done. It's my patient, I want that done. It's my patient, I want that done. There's no coordination of care. Biggest problem every ECMO center has is that, in my opinion. The first part is one thing, but there's one and one. Lack of a coordinator, the person who is the overseer, decider of if there's a conflict, I want to do this, they want to do that, who makes the decision? That's what has to happen. Dr. Soma? I totally agree with it. The way I learned it is when I learned driving a car. Mm -hmm. When you are driving it, you have access to the brake, and the instructor also has access mm -hmm. to the brake. It's like, yeah, that's pretty much it. As simple as that. You have to let one person. You can't have ten people holding the steering wheel. You're gonna go all the way. You, all you're gonna do is go into a ditch at the end of the day. Somebody has to be the the symphony coordinator. Yes, and make sure the maestro, the conductor, so to speak, or the conductor. The, yes, the decision maker, the, right. the the person in charge. Dr. Samir, your thoughts on my thoughts? Uh, nothing new, revolutionary as usual. Two things I'll tell you. I um, mean, I have to attribute to our success, which we learned. Right now, we have a system really, which I think is working very well, and I'm sure you disagree. But right now, we have a center command person who uh, who, will, who will let them know if they're putting an ECMO in a preferred hospital or not. 
that person is an amazing person, has overseen the whole system, and we give him a heads up. And it's not because yes or no, we just run it by him, make sure what his thoughts are. And those patients that get placed on ECMO and preferred hospitals, which is, I think is a good thing for those hospitals to be able to do that with, with an overseer from the main campus, and the opportunity for those patients to come to the main campus when stable. And see, so we have the system with support of tele-ICU. So tele-ICU, telemedicine is supporting those uh, hospitals having ECMOs uh, with centralized protocols. Is that available 24-7? It's not. But we're doing the best uh, that we can under presenting circumstances. I have a resource, Gil, we will call up and say, Gil, what do you think we're going to do? This patient will be transferring soon. We have a plan. It works out very well. Do you agree or you don't agree? I agree. Yeah. You, it, and the center command really uh, person, yeah. the center command president is amazing. I have to call him out. I mean, he really has done an amazing job for us. And we will call him up and say, we're going to put an ECMO in the XYZ hospital. He didn't say his name. I don't think there's anything wrong. Because he's saying nice things about him. So he can actually <laughs> say his so, name. So, I mean, he's a great person. I think he's going to be the new president <laughs> of the Iconic for President Tom McGilvery. He really is an amazing person. We don't think about him. Hashtag Tom McGilvery. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. You know, he really has taught me a lot and helped me with a lot of support. Placing ECMO in preferred hospitals. And help those patients out. And we'll give them like a blueprint. Do they follow anything? No. Yeah, they have to have their own independence. But it's enabled to have patients at periphery. One thing I'll tell you, which we need to get on every ECMO, not every patient going to the ICU. Maybe that's crazy, a palliative care consult. And it's not for end of life, for the plan of the patient. Mm -hmm. People misunderstand that palliative care is end of life. Serena will agree. For the transplant patients, they get palliative care involved in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Through goals of care, mm -hmm. not, not end of care. Mm -hmm. Goals of care. You did a great job at not answering my specific question, Dr. Samir, and I love you to death, but that is exactly what you just did. Okay, that's that's that was a whole lot of really neat stuff, but avoided the fundamental question. You come in one day and you have intensivist A, you, and you have things being run this way, then you're done. Intensivist B walks in and decides to change everything and do it a different way. Day three, there's a whole shift change of all of them, and now you have another group all doing it a different way. When there's no coordination of care, there is therein lies the problem. It's not a matter of, yes, you're in a peripheral hospital. That's great, and I love Dr. McGillivray. He's a great guy, he's a fantastic guy. But making a decision to say, sure, if you think the patient needs ECMO, go ahead, we'll support it, and if we can find a bed for them, they can be transferred here later, is Okay, that's great. I mean, I think that's fantastic to have that kind of support to say, sure, if you think it's medically necessary, go ahead. I can do that. I can do that all day long. But who's taking care of that patient with some type of protocol so that you're not bouncing all over the place and trying this and trying that on every given day, not never, never knowing which one of those particular modalities actually may have been beneficial? That's my problem with the whole thing, John. Well, we have in every one of our ECMO rooms, we put in a whiteboard, and it says up there our goals for the day. When the morning rounds come, and remember what I said, your rounds should not look like this. They should look like this. But you and have one group. Uh, your group. Does your group change? Well, you have one primary ECMO physician who is coordinating, overseeing everything, but inclusive. He's very inclusive of all the other multidisciplinaries coming along with them. So they'll have a discussion, a lengthy discussion of every patient every day about what the plan of action for today is. And by the way, another thing happens. The plan of action goes to the day crew. The night crew comes up with a whole different one. So we have it written on the room, on the, on the whiteboard in the room. Right. What is the plan of action? So you, the doesn't, night crew doesn't change right, it. Right, because that happens a lot. The because the, the well, it doesn't happen or night, doesn't right? it happen, John? I mean, which one or the well, other? You're saying it happens both ways. Well, it we, does or it we, doesn't. we've now prevented it from oh, okay. happening. Okay, so by, it doesn't by doing happen that. anymore. It no. used to. Even with multidisciplinary and single uh, uh, captain driving the ship, it still happened in the night shift. Mm -hmm. And now it's less because of the whiteboard that we have. So the night shift can see, oh, wait, the goals today were to, you know, wean the vent. So you right. see someday they, during the day, they wean the vent, and at night they put the vent up and wean the ECMO. You know, different things like that would happen. Everybody so, thinks it, their it, strategy it, is the best. Gail, what do you, what do you say? I agree with you. I mean, and we do have a multi, 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 multidisciplinary approach at Methodist. Uh, it all, everything gets uh, funneled through one person, or well, not just one person, but uh, a group of select people. They're all involved in, this, in the decisions in regards to our mm -hmm. ECMO patients. Mm -hmm. uh, as Dr. Smear. As but Dr. you don't have rotating, rotating teams. Right. No, no. we don't have rotating chiefs. 
right. uh, that's the difference between a right. center right. and a place that is starting an ECMO program. Your topic was common mistakes made by new ECMO programs, right? right? And I think that is one of the big right. mistakes, mm -hmm. not having someone in charge. It's easy to put the tubes in. Yeah. It's hard to manage the patient after right. all the That's consequences. Right. Serena, what's stuff. your view? So for me, there's nothing more frustrating than when you have plan A and somebody comes in and now there's plan B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. So having one person in charge when the plan changes, you can go to. They look at the patient objectively and can make a decision based on what everybody has put in. I definitely think that would be beneficial. I think so, too. So Dr. Samir. Why going back to me? What yeah, I, just, no, I just want I just want to point something out. Well, so Dr. Samir told me that today he had his he had his crew. He had his crew with yes. him. And he was going to he's like he is set. He's got the big giant army, overwhelming force. Yeah, but I just want to do the numbers. One, two, three, four, five agree five, including myself. I'll agree with myself. All agreed with me. But the, the problem is none of, none of them get the call from the periphery. I do. Yeah, I, I get the call from the periphery. I would err on the side of the patient every day of the week. Yeah. But you would I think probably I need prefer, for you, in your job, in your line of work, you would probably prefer that there was one key person that, that oversees all the other. Otherwise, you keep well, getting I different. I, I, that's, that's, right? For me, it's one key person. I, mean, right. I call the director, and I run things by him. We make yeah. a plan, and we proceed. I cannot control what happens every minute, mm. and, uh, but I try to give uh, like, uh, like we're a global plan. Things might change. Remember, this is a different hospitals, not one mm. hospital only. In our own hospital, there's no problem. Mm. But in those different hospitals, we have to give the patient the best chance, even if there's some risks involved. No, I don't And I'm mind. willing to take those risks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, but we're talking apples and oranges. We're not I, I agree. You're just you trying to prove your point for no reason. You take the chance and put a patient on ECMO <laughs> that has, limit, has, has almost no chance of survival. Look, I understand. That's... That's an emotional decision. I I get it. Okay, I'm not you know I'm not I'm not a I'm not a monster where I just you're don't sure you're not. Yeah, I'm not a monster. <laughs> not yet anyway. But we're talking about if you're gonna be in charge, then the people who are managing the patient at the bedside, notwithstanding they may have to make medical medical decisions by virtue of what is happening in the moment that may be different than what the 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 protocols you set forth. But when there is, it's actually working or the patient is stable and they just want to play with things because they think their way is better and don't like your way, that's where the problem comes in. And to tell me that you don't believe you, can, you can't be there every minute, I agree with you, you can't be every, there every minute. But if you have a system and you have a protocol in place, then people either should follow it or you should find other people. I think that's there's a problem with all of these people all doing the Sesame Street, do it my way, which kid is doing their own thing. Because uh, I don't think that's a best practice. That's my view. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to stay quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's time for us to go for a break. Oh my God. Okay, so so, so we, need, we need a 10 minute break. And and look, if the, what happens to Egyptians? Let me see. You know, the Egyptians don't. What, what's your method of execution over there? Is it is it hanging, firing squad, or sawing off the head? No, I would not go outside if I was you. Maybe there's a drone looking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's take a ten minute break, please. We'll see y'all back in ten minutes. Mix cannula, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. 
For venous femoral access, the Levanova Wrap Cannula features a dual-stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure. So it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, 
and meals out, this totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionists and for Perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today.
Where am I going? Right, there you go. Hey, welcome back, everyone. I switched seats, and uh, now uh, we're going to go straight into Serena Patrick's presentation, Lung Transplant, A New Lease on Life After COVID-19. So welcome back, and Serena, thank you very much. Looking forward to the talk. Thank you. And I feel very fortunate. Dr. Soma, I may be picking on you a little bit during this presentation, so we'll make it through together. So first, I want to talk about why do we transplant patients. So indications according to the ISHLT are for advanced end-stage pulmonary diseases such as ILD, COPD, pulmonary hypertension, and cystic fibrosis. In addition to having a high, which is greater than 50% risk of death within two years, and high, greater than 80% likelihood of survival at least 90 days after surgery, and high, greater than 80% likelihood of a five-year post-transplant survival with adequate graft function. What we've learned is with more experience, we've gotten better at selecting our patients. Would you agree? Yes. We're going to talk about some contraindications for lung transplant. As you notice, some of them are going to be bolded and highlighted. These are things that we're going to start discussing when we talk about lung transplant in COVID patients. So some absolute contraindications are malignancy. So that is a recent history for some centers of at least two years cancer-free. That's for non-melanoma skin cancers. Most centers um, will prefer five years cancer-free for sarcomas, melanomas, and breast cancers. Poorly controlled significant dysfunction of other organs, such as the heart, kidney, liver, or brain. This is going to be very important when we start looking at patients who were selected and transplanted after they had COVID-19. Unstable medical conditions such as sepsis, MIs or liver failure, irreversible bleeding disorders, poorly controlled infections such as COVID, functionally limited when you're talking about patients who have been in the hospital for a very long time and in mobile. And then, of course, obesity, like we spoke about earlier, which is a BMI greater than 35. Relative contraindications for lung transplant include age, greater than 65. Some centers are a little bit more friendly than others, um, but typically we will not go above the age of 75. Mechanical ventilation and or ECMO. For those patients, we need to be very selective in who we consider, and they must have no acute or chronic other in organ failure. Coronary artery disease, which, cause, which could cause in organ failure after transplant, so we need to consider the extent of that CAD and what type of stent they've had. Other diseases that are not well controlled, such as diabetes, GERD, hypertension, or epilepsy, significant osteoporosis, or significant malnutrition. So some of the factors that we look at when we're looking at organ allocation for the lung is going to be both the survival benefit on top of medical urgency, their waiting time, distance from the donor hospital, and if they're for children, their pediatric status. So this is what I'm going to pick on you a little bit. So this is going to be a time for reflection. This is a statement from OPTN or the UNOS Ethics Committee. Because donated, or, donated organs are a severely limited resource, the best potential recipients should be identified. The probability of a good outcome must be highly emphasized to achieve the maximum benefit for all transplants. So my question is, how do we, in the transplant field, select how we're going to move forward? Who is the best candidate because these organs are so scarce? Can I, well, can I add one more uh, thing to it? <laughs> As, uh, would you consider uh, differentiating between regular and DCD? Again, uh, so, uh, those are very good questions. So let me just give you a historical perspective on how transplantation, and even if you look at the uh, the contraindications and the relative contraindications. If you look, when I started my uh, training and became got into transplantation was like 2009 to now, it's 11 years. When I started off, if you had a patient with HIV, you had a patient with Hep C, uh, if you had anybody who hit 60 mark, we would not transplant. Uh, because at the juncture, uh, the outcomes we weren't sure about, we did not know how to manage those patients and, and everything else. So, in a, in a span of 10 years, if you look at first thing, let's talk about age. If you look at 2019, almost 35% to 38% of the patients are 65 plus, and I think 12% are 70 plus. How did we reach this point? Cumulative accumulated experience and learning from it, and, and, um, and um, essentially identifying whom we can help and whom we um, cannot help. And going back to Pepsi, 
It doesn't matter anymore. HIV with whole fact, now we take actually donors with uh, HIV positive and transplant them to HIV um, positive patients. So there's a lot of progress in that field. So when you start talking about probability of a good outcome, I think that's the perspective. As you know, HRSA had a very good intention in 2010. And that's something which we always are like, why do we have a medical review board? And it's not just like me as a medical director walking and say, oh, I want to get this patient transplanted. Because we, do, we as a group think you want to eliminate those individual biases and somebody to have an object evidence. Why would um, Dr. Hani come to an MRV meeting when we were in Houston Methodist? For somebody to look at the objectively and, and say, hey, this has been our experience in general. This is what has been. Um, in our center, and this is what we have done well, and these are the patients we have not done not so well. I think that's where it comes into, and absolutely, especially in a COVID scenario, one, we need to ask a question is, does the patient need a transplant? So, which is where the natural evolution of the disease. Would I go ahead and jump on somebody who's on an ECMO and just had a COVID and he's 10 days out? Probably not. That's not the timing to talk about transplant. I want to give him a reasonable time period before I say, or the guy has persistent ARDS, he has an irreversible injury, before I go and say, okay, now I want to talk about a lung transplantation. Now I've reached that juncture. Now where do I go? Like you pointed out, somebody on a vent and, and uh, on an ECMO cannula paralyzed for three weeks. Yeah, we can replace the organs. You guys do it. We can put on cardiopulmonary bypass. You can look, make the numbers look good. You can take a heart out and keep somebody alive for 10 hours. But the game starts after you come off. It's the same thing. If we do not think as a clinical judge or essentially as a clinician, if I do not think there is a reasonable chance for that patient want to survive the surgery and have a reasonable outcome from there, then probably he's not the ideal candidate. And that's the thought process which comes into mind. And as you said, different teams, yeah, next week, maybe a different team, one of my colleagues will come in. Maybe he'll have a different perspective on it. And uh, that's, that goes in. And that's the reason why we emphasize our, I kind of like that my, um, medical review board, a group of people to make the choice rather than individual biases, especially when you're taking care of a patient, there is a lot of bias which does come into interact with the family and everything. And you want people who are not directly involved in the patient care, but can give you an object to idea where we are. And, and I totally agree with it. Yes. Do, can we transplant everybody with COVID? Absolutely not. We all know the answer. Yes, I'm sure there are certain people who will benefit from it. It's an evolution, very limited experience, which has been published so far. So let's see, it's a learning curve, and I learned a lot from mine because I just we just looked at it at a different aspect of what people have done so far, and we wanted to give it a shot. Touch wood, it has turned out good. So. I want to ask you something about yes. uh, the length of time on the vent in and of itself. Since you're going to transplant that lung, how does that play in? In other words, if that lung has been on the vent for a very long time, but we're not going to have that long anymore, right? So, so that's a um, very good question. Um, I mean, how, some of you know, Dr. Hani must have seen it. So why do we transplant somebody? The two major indications is pulmonary fibrosis with interstitial lung disease, and next is COPD in United States. So who are the people who would be on a ventilator and potentially going for a transplant is more likely to be a guy with interstitial lung disease than flare up, what we call an acute exacerbation which actually majority of times can happen in a non-infectious context. That's just a primary inflammatory process which has driven it. Would I transplant somebody on a ventilator, probably, especially AT tube? Probably not. Because especially would I evaluate a patient on an AT tube? Probably not. That's, that's just fine because I strongly believe, again, that's as a, as a physician and as a transplant professional, that the patient needs to be involved in that decision. This is not cardiac. This is not doing a bypass surgery. You do a surgery, everything is hunky dorky and they go home. This is something, the surgery is one party. It's a life or life session. Mm -hmm. And after that, the patient has to be involved in it. And it's his choice. He has to make the choice. Is it something I want to take? I've met people who said, Doc, you know what? I don't think this is for me. And I absolutely respect the decision. They have to be in it. The way I tell my patients, it's not like a Black Friday sale. You ran to Walmart, got something, and you woke up on Saturday morning and decided, nah, I don't want to let me go back again. Mm -hmm. Transplant ain't that. You have to stick to it. So we're going to look at COVID-19, uh, their current numbers and its effects. So as of yesterday, September 11th, there was over 6 million people in the United States who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. As of yesterday, there was 191,000 people in the U.S. who have died from COVID-19. 
as we know, it's impacted many of our industries, especially in the healthcare field. It's really changed the way that we've had to provide healthcare. Dr. Samir's favorite, we've now leaned heavily on telemedicine. For us as nursing, it's really changing how we're having to screen patients both before and after, even when they're coming into clinic appointments, before the transplant surgery. And then as we discussed about earlier, working with limited resources. So we did have some periods where there weren't enough ECMO machines. How do you select who moves forward with transplant? So COVID-19 in our lung transplant recipients. So we're going to discuss a case of a 30-year-old male who was post-lung transplant. and He contracted COVID one year after his transplant surgery. Now, he was the first lung transplant recipient that received convalescent plasma for COVID-19. Now, that's plasma which is enriched with antibodies to help fight the virus, and that's coming from a previously infected patient. So he was febrile in the ICU with failing kidneys. And within hours after receiving the plasma infusion, his fever started decreasing. Days later, his breathing became easier and his kidney function improved. On day number nine after the infusion, he actually tested negative for COVID-19. He was released home on May 1st and he continues to test negative. Now, I heard you said that you all have used the convalescent plasma. Yes, um, actually it's part of the trial which is going on in Memorial Hermann as a system, yes. Everybody gets uh, convalescent plasma mm -hmm. and remdesivir nowadays. I think for me, anecdotally, again, everything for me is anecdotal. Setting, I'm not in an academic center. I, again, <laughs> once again, um, I'm coming at this from a community based setting versus academic center, and so my observations are very anecdotal. I think some people seem to respond well to it, and others have no response to it at all. Absolutely. I mean, that's um, as there are different ways of looking at it, essentially. One way would be, um, I don't want to say it, but some it's, it's a groundbreaking thing. I don't know, but even if you look at the data, at least people are coming in, especially from China and, and Italy, the concentration of the antibody, how higher the titers are, that plays a role. Do we take every, everybody who has IgG positive and infuse it? Maybe, maybe not. Again, it's similar to what something, a viral infection like, say, influenza. Yeah, we all develop antibodies to it, but it doesn't mean it protects you. Maybe not. You need something more. You need a cellular response. Maybe it's a combination of both of them. So we don't know. Yes, that's something which has shown. But again, in the biggest trial which has been done, the reason why even NIH, NIH was very hesitant to endorse it was the rush to try different treatments and the pool got muddy. It never became, yes, no convalescent serum. It just became, yes, convalescent serum plus A, B, C, D, D, and S, convalescent serum with just A and B. And yes, convalescent serum with just A. So it's very difficult to say that answer as of right now. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my opinion. Benign, definitely, in this current era, probably should be tried. Yeah, we'll do no, we won't do harm. Yeah. We, are, we can agree on that. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. So this 30-year-old patient was actually part of University of Chicago Medicine clinical trial. The trial recruited University of Chicago patients and other patients from the Chicago area who had recovered from COVID-19. So they previously had tested positive and are at home and recovered. So in, it is in the first phase and it's being assessed as a treatment option for the critically ill patients as those that have severe life-threatening illness. Um, the convalescent plasma is being used as a treatment option in China, New York, and then as we hear here in Houston. A single plasma donor can be used to treat multiple transfusion recipients. Once researchers have validated that this, it's safe and basically that it's valid and valuable, um, we're going to start looking at the effectiveness as a treatment option, as we just previously discussed. Mm -hmm. So, and again, and, and forgive me, but I, I don't hope you don't mind. We no, have sort okay. of a free-flowing kind of deal here. We don't necessarily follow, you know, just not, you know, get all the lecture done. But, you know, I noticed that it was for those that were critically ill, those that were failing everything else, and then they get the convalescent plasma. And I have to scratch my head just a little bit and wonder, I mean, are we just waiting too long? Is it, you know, why do we wait until they, maybe we should prevent that there's uh, something from happening? This is in the trial. But the clinical reality is being given right now, not as a last resort. It is. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's being given early. The idea is essentially anybody who's developing the idea is he's actually getting it. Okay. So, so, so you're, the trigger for giving it is, is, is early. Well, and that also comes with the caveat that the two patients, at least we transplanted, as I was telling you, one got an infection somewhere in the middle of the month, 
went to the ER, got positive, x-ray was fine. Uh, six days or seven days after the exposure, then goes back after a week later, now hypoxic and x-ray is different. So it took some time where the other patient says, yeah, I went to a barbecue a week prior to that and next week when he went to the ER, he is hypoxic and x-ray shows again. Again, it's very difficult to predict how long it has been. All we know is from the point they contacted, had a contact with the healthcare facility and the diagnosis has been made. Again, uh -huh. you, know, you see, I mean, yes. what happened prior to that, we don't know. Yes. It is not like an experiment we used to run in the, in the lab. You have a mice, 1,200, I injected LPS. 1,800, I cut the mice down and then took the spleen. Or 2,400, I took the spleen out and I know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. But there is so much uncertainty on it. When do we give it? It's, it's very difficult. Again, it goes back to, it's like a old wine before antibiotics came in Second World War or anything. One of the treatments for infections was to give serum. That's what it used to be called, was take serum yeah. and give it. And all the infections which existed at that point of time, something simple like pneumonia from pneumococcus. Uh, one of the ways we, I mean, I'm sure Dr. Hani would have learned in his microbiology, the way we used to detect it is actually give plasma to on it so the antibodies bind to the cell wall and that's how you can visualize it because antibody plays a big role in controlling how pneumococcus is cleared by the body. And the reason why we vaccinate people who don't have immune suppression or who don't have a spleen because it helps you clear that. Does it expand to every known infectious agent? Probably not. So it's a pretty big unknown in that way. So we are just rehashing what has been done like 50, 60 years back and trying to put back in. It's a great Basics thought. Of microbiology. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. great thought, but we don't know. Let me put that answer. Mm -hmm. One thing is not really available. It's not like a drug. Gilead can ship it. So it's really the availability and the mm -hmm. blood donation centers. And it's a lot of work to get mm -hmm. the compressor mm -hmm. plasma. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's expensive to make. Yes. It. And you have to have, it's like, it's like stem cells. Yes. You have to have a high yield. Yeah. You have to have a high yield of the antibody. That's right. Forgive me. No, you're all right. So lung transplant for COVID-19. So back in May of this year, there was a patient that was successfully transplanted in Europe. It's an unnamed 45-year-old woman in Austria, and that was at Vinia Medical University and their general hospital. So she was previously in good health with no prior health conditions. This is a theme that you're going to see in the, the couple of patients that we're going to discuss about. However, her condition rapidly deteriorated. So another important and a, kind of a hot topic, her PCR tested, test showed COVID particles were still present, but they felt that she was not actively infected. And that was confirmed with a negative viral culture. So like I said, she was the first transplant in Europe for lung damage caused by COVID-19. She also did have low platelet counts, which can be very dangerous going into a major transplant surgery. She also had antibodies present in her blood. That really takes the risk profile of a transplant up. So you have COVID-19 and now someone who has high levels of antibodies in her blood. So she required immune apheresis to prevent organ rejection, trying to lower those antibodies and get her successfully through the transplant surgery. However, they did report that that surgery was very complicated, but it was successful. She did have a long recovery and they're hoping to get her discharged home. Uh, they are reporting that she's doing well and there's no major problems at this time. So this was the first one that I was able to find back in May. So now let me ask you, so what's, what's the deal? What's the rejection situation with those lungs? Like, how are you going to manage the rejection mass? I know I'm asking a very heavy question. <laughs> that is a controversy in every CMPI right now. You know, as you know, very, I'm sorry, sir, but you're smart. You're the <laughs> smart guy. I have to ask you a question. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Um, I mean, you know, immune suppression, yes, broadly, we know what we do. Uh, like, in, if you look at SRT in the United States, we are heavy on, like, say, program yeah. and, um, and giving uh, micro cell set or microphone lay. That's our preferred dual agent. So if you look back, and uh, I mean, prior to this, there were a couple of studies which came from China. Obviously, we, they came from China. Nobody wants to talk about it. But if you look at their immune suppression, yeah. uh, I'm not negating that aspect. But in general, uh, it always needs to be taken with them um, I mean, based on the history. But I'm sure they did a great job, actually, if you look at it. They are more cyclosporin-based. Uh, our tendency, what we do as an immune suppression, there should be no change in regards to if it's COVID or non-COVID. It's very rare scenarios where the, the induction and what your initial strategy is any different. That's my uh, my opinion. Well, let me ask you, if you get like right now, like a long, an existing long transplant patient is COVID positive, you change the rejection meds? Um, that's again, is a very knee-jerk response, I honestly feel. 
Um, immune system both has a good way, control an infection, also a bad way where you can actually create inflammation just per se by itself. As of right now, with the limited clinical tools which we have, we cannot answer it in a clinically meaningful way. See, if somebody comes in with a severe pneumonia, is leukopenic and everything else, probably at that juncture, I would rather actually increase the steroids and maybe hold the cell set because it does inhibit your uh, lymphocyte proliferation and things like that. But again, it's very case to case. Would I alter it specifically because somebody has COVID? Absolutely not. I think infections are infections. You just control it. So the second case we'll talk about is from June of 2020. This was a 28-year-old female who received a double lung transplant after contracting COVID-19. This was also done in Chicago. So again, she was previously healthy with no serious underlying medical conditions, but she became critically ill due to COVID-19. Now this patient was actually in the hospital for six weeks prior to transplant, full life support, ventilated on ECMO, anything that you can think of, this is what she needed to get to this point for transplant. Now, weeks passed with no improvement, and they showed irreversible damage began starting to stress out her heart and her liver. So the decision was made to work her up and actually list her for transplant after she tested negative for the virus. She was only listed for a few days before she found her match and was transplanted. So she was actually the first known lung transplant, excuse me, first known lung transplant for damage caused by COVID-19 here in the U.S. It was a 10-hour surgery, and it was more difficult due to the amount of inflammation from COVID-19, and it left the lungs stuck to the surrounding tissue, her heart, her chest wall, and the diaphragm. Her recovery was very rough. Her illness actually made the patient too weak to breathe. So she recovered on the vent until her strength returned. So imagine that. We talk about patients being too weak to walk. This patient was too weak to even breathe on her own, but we transplanted her, okay? Now, she was released July 9th and is now needed, not needing any supplemental oxygen. So Dr. Barat, which is the chief thora thoracic surgeon, felt this was the patient's only chance of survival, but also states that lung transplant will not be an option for every patient who has damage due to COVID-19. He felt that patients should be young, relatively healthy, very functional in their past, with minimal or no comorbidities. Would you agree with this statement? Yes, I do. I mean... Now, we are talking about different things. As a patient, yeah, I probably would have uh, not the ideal patient I want to try on something, especially when I have a novel disease I'm facing with. I mean, if you read about it, she was on a ventilator, she got ECMO support, had thoracotomies, chest tubes, just bare, just for the surgical aspect, she was a high risk. I'm sure she developed additions and things, which obviously they saw when they did the surgery. I mean, again, as I always tell people, can the surgery be done? Yeah, absolutely. Transplant surgery is very well um, honed technique, you can Absolutely. do it on everybody. The thing is, is the patient going to make out from it? That's where the, uh, a, the game starts. And I think one of the hunches was with her, she was young, very functional, and then the, probably that's what swayed the medical review board in Chicago. I cannot obviously second guess what their thought process was. I'm sure that played a big role that she was young, and the chance of her recovering is a lot easier when you're 35 compared to somebody who's like 70. Of question. Did they know at the time prior to the surgery that the lung was attached to the heart and surrounding tissues like that, or is that something they found out? Dr. Hani can comment. He has seen enough thoracic surgeries. Yeah, I mean, surgeries. you can get all kinds of CAT scans that you want, but unless you get in there, see how mm -hmm. stuck it is, mm -hmm. and how different the surgery is, a bit different dissection is what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you have to be prepared for that. And like you know, Soma said, we have amazing surgeons that can handle these situations very well. And they get, getting to the surgery, I think, like he said, is the easiest part. What's going to happen after that? That's mm -hmm. the most difficult part. Yeah. But you know, you taught me something today. Because I was looking at my brother cat scans and saying, there's no way their lungs are going to recover. Lungs are going to recover. Okay. You know, see like a block of blood. There's no one air cavity. And there's no way that lungs are going to recover. Okay. I mean, as you rightly pointed out, anytime you violate the pleural space, either by a large bowl chest tube or prior surgeries, pleuresis, or even a bypass surgery, and they developed a post uh, uh, cardiotomy pleural effusion, Inflammation will happen and there will be additions between the pleural, mm -hmm. um, sorry, visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. It always makes a big uh, uh, difficulty regarding dissecting a patient. Mm -hmm. Because unlike a, unlike a bypass surgery, you open the sternum, the heart is sitting mm -hmm. right there. When you do a lung transplant, it's like you have a small window and you're digging it. Mm -hmm. So it, it really makes a big challenge. Well, that's why IPF is very much more difficult surgery than COPD surgery. Right. Yeah. So COPD is a chip shot. Mm -hmm. IPF, 
Mm-hmm. These guys be on standby for COPD. IPF needs to be bypassing the time. Yeah. Well, that's similar to like reoperations for, for, for cardiac reoperations. The, the fibrosis it and the scarring and the adhesions yeah. it is just it, sometimes, yeah. sometimes you can't even do all the graphs yeah, because and you can't get back out. So, so you encounter this type of thing where you have these adhesions around the lung. Yeah, that's so one of the clinical... It's not that unusual. I mean, yeah. this might have been a severe case, but... Yeah, it's not unusual. I'm as surprised that they saw it, absolutely. Yeah. I okay. think that's what we would have... Anybody, a reasonable team, would know that mm-hmm. that's what they're going to face when they're going. Mm. So, in July of 2020, the yeah. University of Chicago yeah. Northwestern Memorial Hospital actually completed their second transplant for COVID-19. Now, this was a 62-year-old male. He also was relatively healthy with no underlying conditions. He was transferred from an outside hospital to Northwestern Memorial for lung transplant consideration where they worked him up. Now, this patient was on ECMO for 100 days. He was listed um, once he also tested negative and transplanted within 72 hours. It was another difficult surgery over 10 hours, and they found this time necrosis and mass inflammation once his chest was open. Now, a little bit different and also increasing this patient's risk profile he had a previous major chest surgery at the other hospital for massive infection. Now, luckily, he was able to be excavated 24 hours after his transplant surgery, and this is actually a picture of his explanted lung. I mean, that's almost unbelievable to hear that he was he was he was he was, he was on ECMO 100 days. He's transplanted after the listed and transplanted within 72 hours of testing. And then he was extubated 24 hours after the transplant. That's amazing. I'm looking at his picture and he doesn't have a tracheostomy. So probably what he had was a single lumen on the IJ and he just stayed on a VB ECMO and O2 supplementation non-invasively. That I can tell you. Yeah. And that I'm not surprised He about. wasn't previously too. Yeah. yeah I mean, he wasn't on the bed. But again, I'm just making an assumption looking at his picture and mm-hmm. his neck. Mm-hmm. I don't see a tracheostomy there. And especially yes. that's immediately after extubation from the surgery. But then he must have been bridged just with non-invasive ventilation and a BVF, which I think is a very good uh, idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. I, I think so too. Because if he was, if he had been intubated for those hundred plus days, mm-hmm. then you start the sedation. I don't believe And, and then be, all the different yeah. stories start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's long. That's long. It's not recoverable. I mean, yeah. there was not a recovery. No, but that's one. Is that the entire lung? Or is that the section? Is that a load? Um, it's very difficult to say. And did he have? You know, and and is that from how much contribution is that from the previous? You know, you said he had an empyema. So he, um, it just said major chest surgery. They didn't go into. I would think yeah, so yeah. probably from an empyema. Again, remember this is a deflated lung. It's not like an inflated lung. Right, deflated lungs always yeah, are more smaller and mm-hmm. bodier and, and things mm-hmm. like that. Okay. Thanks. So COVID nineteen lung transplantation, transplant patient takeaway point. While complicated, it can be done. It offers those with no other options a chance. It does take teamwork and a multidisciplinary approach, which we've talked about previously today, with the pulmonologist, surgeons, anesthesia, your intensivist, infectious disease. It won't be an option for every COVID-19 patient. You must be careful to make sure the virus is cleared before starting the immunosuppressants. You want to assess your patients for any other organ dysfunction which may make transplant a contraindication. And the effect and results of transplant in this population are still unknown. Like we said, there's really not that many patients that have been done, so there's still more to see and see if it's safe and how they do after the transplant surgery, especially when you're talking about immunosuppressants. Are there more patients to come? So we must ask ourselves, will more transplant centers be willing to transplant COVID-19 patients? And how do we choose who to list? Let's, um, again, um, it's, it's very, um, so take back, step back. So I trained in India. I went to a hospital, which was probably the only one which would actually refuse an admission of a patient if they did not have a bed, um, being a public hospital, so which was a big deal. So in my hospital, the only patients who got hemodialysis was people who were listed for a kidney transplant. Why is, did the hospital come to resource allocation? So their take was somebody has a living donor who's going to donate a kidney for this patient and his match, those other people we will have willing to support and take that expense and go along. With it. So we are talking about resources. So let's come back to U.S. Adequate resources, everything is there. 
Why is transplantation supported by events in Medicare? It all stems down to from kidney transplant. You have 20 odd patients. It's more expensive to support a patient on hemodialysis than for them to get a kidney Absolutely. transplant. And there is cost saving across the board on all the organs. And actually, the biggest ones are kidney and lung, lo behold. If you have chronic lung disease and you simulate them, there's actually a paper which was published four years back, or five years back, actually. Um, you actually save more money if a patient goes for a transplant evaluation. If he gets a transplant or not, it's a different story compared to somebody who goes for usual care and wherever they are. So that's definitely there is a benefit. Now we come down to the pandemic and where we are. One of the often, if you look at the ERJ, just published a editorial following up that COVID positive patient from Vienna whom they listed. And one of the questions, uh, one of the um, arguments which was made was when we already have uh, difficulty accessing donors, is it justifiable to transplant these patients who have a post-acute illness? I think that argument becomes a little circumferential. I, I'm not a big believer in penalization. If that's the argument, then I can go and take the devil's advocate and say, why should I transplant a patient with emphysema? He knew smoking is bad for him. He knew he was taking a risk for COPD. Then why should I go and transplant? Then where, that, that, where does that argument stop? It can go to anywhere from there. Oh, I don't want to transplant a familial PF patient. No, I don't want to transplant a cystic fibrosis patient because that's his parents' fault. They had um, E1 copy of the gene and they gave it to the kid. Why should I transplant? It was their fault. So it's a very slippery slope ethically. As a physician, as a hospital, somebody walks into my ICU, these patients will not be any different from any other patient with acute on chronic severe lung disease or severe acute lung injury. I think that's my take. I think you should evaluate them similar to that. One, do they qualify for the treatment? And the next question, we all talk in a group, just because I have a hammer doesn't mean I should go and start nailing something down. Is it an appropriate time? I think in that regard, we will be seeing more patients, absolutely, definitely. And probably as a group in the country, as uh, I think people are going to do a lot more transplants, I'm sure, over the next few months to a year. And we'll start seeing, obviously, somebody will be pushing the barriers and then going on it, and we'll see a lot more responses from it. I think, in my opinion, absolutely, you should be. Like any other patients, you evaluate for a lung transplant. These patients should be evaluated at the same time. That's my take on it. Very good. Interesting. <laughs> what other risks are involved in transmitting patients like this? So what I can say based on the experience we have and the two people we have, so why did we deliberately choose the patients I chose or as a group we chose to transplant? One, ambulatory, following all the, um, uh, they made the decisions along with their families. Um, they're part participating in physical therapy. Um, in spite of being bedbound and minimal exertion, one guy biked every day. He made it a point. He used a bike in his room and bike. The other guy was walking around on 100% non, uh, non rebreather So they were still functionally active. Virgin chest, never have been undergone any sort of chest surgery, chest tubes or nothing of that sort. So those were the things which came into my consideration. If you ask me, had I met the patient from Vienna and had I met these two patients, who were transplanted in Chicago, and I was the first guy, and I did not have any knowledge anybody has done it, I would say my answer would have been, I'm sorry, they're too sick to transplant. So I learned something. Yes, it can be done. Looks like patients have uh, recovered from it. Is it because of the COVID virus? No, it was not because of the COVID virus, but on the day of the surgery where they were, two to three months, being on ECMO, being on, on a ventilator, multiple surgeries, chest tube placement, that is the risk factors which I'm thinking about, not the COVID and everything else. So I think that, that's, again, going in future, that would still be my trend. And if you ask my surgeon too, probably that would be our uh, question too. We don't want to take patients who have been in the hospital bed bound for a long period of time or ECMO or anything. I don't, as a group, we do not think the risk of doing a surgery on them is so beneficial or the risk benefit is, I don't think it's so spectacular. Let me put mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Very good. What if you were to add in things like hypertension, diabetes, CKD? Very good uh, question. Diabetes, manageable. You can treat it as long as the patient is compliant. We have excellent for type 2 and type 1. So as I always tell people, chronic medical problems are chronic medical problems. There will be if somebody comes in, especially in this case, like one of the issues we had, uh, 
We have a very stringent dietitian who always believes everybody should have a hemoglobin C, A1C less than 7. If a patient is 2 months and receives steroids, there is no way even a normal person hemoglobin A1C would be 8 and 10. So that's again, it's something we induced insulin intolerance by an active infection, by the treatment which we gave, and probably the chronic immobility which we caused in this patient. Is it something which is irreversible? Absolutely not. Is it something which can be worked upon? Yes. And that's my philosophy. If I go on, I always, I mean, my, the way I want to look at it or my philosophy would be, these are all chronic issues. It's never a A to B to C to D. These all run simultaneously. And that is where, that's why transplant is such a multidisciplinary practice because you need all the different people and you do all of them simultaneously. You don't wait for all. I'm going to wait for the hemoglobin A1C to normalize. Then I'm going to talk about what it is. Same thing with CKD. Once you hit CKD stage 3 or even 4A, uh, sorry, not 4, 4, um, you need to think about it because you can induce, uh, induce AKI and higher chance they may end up on dialysis, which you want to prevent. Depends on your surgeon. Some people do an excellent job of not pre-inducing AKI. As well, Dr. Hani can say, every cardiothoracic surgeon has his unique signature, yeah. which you see in the labs. And the, so some, some are more kidney friendly and some are not. So that's, that's, the, that's the way I would, I think. I think we find that in perfusion too. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm I think sure. our perfusion technique makes a huge difference. Huge difference. I think you, uh, uh, of course, I, I was going to mention this during your talk too. I think uh, when we sit there and run hemoglobin to six, to seven, if we're not transfusing those patients, notwithstanding transfusions have their own risks and complications. I understand. It's, it's, it's almost in my mouth. I mean, seriously, <laughs> I can't have it any further, any closer. I'll, I'll speak up. But uh, um, I think very low hematocrits, low DO2, um, just exacerbates an already Absolutely. existing problem. So when we put patients on pump, surgeon A, you know, let's keep the hemoglobin higher on this patient. They have a little underlying AKI. They do well. The other surgeon is like, ah, just we're going to do it just like we always do it on everybody else. The hemoglobin is 5.8, 5. 5. you know, 5.96. And those patients have worsening AKI when the operation is over. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Now, we for, see that too. Sorry. sorry no, go ahead. Jeff. Sorry. For those patients who have recovered from COVID-19, have you seen any lasting effects? So this is, again, as I told you, we are just nine months into it. Um, all we can predicate people, obviously... The biggest thing we have a data on who passed away or who succumbed to it. We don't have much information on who are the people recovered. The one off and my um, my experience I've directly dealt with. One was a post transplant patient, young kid, uh, hung out and had a party in Beaumont, developed COVID, coughed, had a fever for a day. We watched him for three days and went home. And we see him IgG positive. And a couple of ILD patients pre transplant who were developed it and got. Plus, um, I mean, so, um, I think they, they actually did very well. So how do we follow them up? I still don't have any. Yeah, we want to we wanna cheat I'm, from you, uh, me and Serena, because I know what we're going to follow up. And uh, so you're okay. Well, do you want to get CAT scans on your patient's post? Uh, how about, what I'm talking about. <laughs> do you want to get echoes? Echo from what? <laughs> so I'm just asking you, sir, I'm just, we have a uh, mandate on us. Uh -huh. So do you want to get CAT scans and uh, follow sure. up echoes? But again, it's again as a as a since it's unknown, do we want to do it as a mass and mass right now and see from it? One, we don't know what the risk is. As as Joe used a word, very nice. We are all pontificating based on our accrued medical knowledge and our own thought behind it and what we have. Um, uh, we think should be the optimal way of it. If somebody is doing it as a process, even in ERJ, um, Dr. Um, um, Ganeshra, who actually was a primary author on it, he's an ILD guru, I agree, but he had this schedule he wanted to follow or he recommended for people to follow. That again is probably just, it's like having a road and having it divided in the middle, A one guy to stick to the right and the other guy come to the left, because at least it gives you a guidance and a structure, something later on you can down. If you ask me absolutely, do you need an echo as a clinician? I would say probably not. But in a bigger picture, you're following them up and you want to see how they're evolving. Absolutely. Evolving. Later on, you can always look back and down tight. PFTs. Same, Same thing again. Which leads yeah. me to my question. So should they follow a pulmonologist? Um, if 
Does everybody who has a runoff of mill should go on to a pulmonologist? Probably not. But again, limited data, even at three months, people report that they are having symptoms. Does that symptom just translate from the fact they had a bad viral infection or they truly have some sort of pulmonary physiological impairment? It's very difficult to say. Whom would I like to see? Absolutely, if anybody has been discharged. I think it's a good idea to see uh, a pulmonologist. Probably we are, it's not like we are any smarter than anybody else, but probably we are more focused and it's a primarily a respiratory ailment. So we can give the judgment call to see how people are doing and study radiologically, physiologically with the PFT, see if there are any abnormalities or not. And then will the damage continue to the point where these patients may need a lung transplant and oh get to come and see it's us? It's a um, we probably are going to wrap up our um, paper in the next week or two doing a lot of immune histochemistry on it because my, our lab where I, we collaborate with and we have we are intensely focused on uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So one of the questions we wanted to look at is um, what we are seeing in this persistent ARDS is it post-COVID ARDS fibrotic changes? Does it actually mimic IPF? So if that's the case, can we do some treatment options on these people to still require a lot of oxygen one month and two months out? Um, it's an emerging story. I haven't seen the slides myself for the last week. They were stained, so next week hopefully we'll have some answer. But I'm sure I'm going to keep you guys in the loop because I am, as a scientist, I'm really excited to look at those explanted lungs. The reason being um, unvarnished, no ECMOs, no ventilator, and all the super, uh, super added insults, which can change the primary lung pathology as such pathologically. So these are like what I call pristine progression of ARDS. And unfortunately for both of them, it remained persistent, whatever that inflammatory change was. And when we looked at the HNE slides, you can see nice microvascular abscesses where the just lungs look like just lysed itself off because it got impacted. And the blood vessels, at least a couple of them had webs. We all talked about how it affects the vas vascular endothelium. So this is like an injury somewhere the endothelium was damaged and it healed and formed a scar and occluded the pulmonary artery. But again, um, you can say it's only on two patients, but at least on those two, I can say, hey, probably these are the signs which, which explain why the patient is not improving his artery may help really a lot in terms of how we treat these patients early Absolutely. on. Probably that's will. really, I think, what we're, what we're hoping for from yep. that data. That's, that's going to be very interesting. That's all I got for you, Joe. Excellent. That's all you got for us. That that's was pretty doggone good. Excellent. That wasn't just, that's all I got for you. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank that you. That was terrific. So just uh, as an offhand, uh, University of Washington has a registry. It's actually run by an IDE fellow. They have a 1,000 post-solid organ transplant patients. If you want, I'll forward you the, the link to it. It's a red cap. It's an open access. Uh, they published the preliminary 400 patient data. Now they have 1,000 patients apparently, all of okay. them in the United States who had a transplant done, then got exposed to COVID. Okay. So if you have anybody, please do add on to it. I think it's a group uh, knowledge to see how people are doing. Outstanding. Okay. Um, Dr. Samir, would you like to give your update on COVID-19 now? You sure have time for that? It's a long lecture. That's entirely up to you. It was, it was no, to I don't make the decision. You <laughs> are making the decision. I am deferring all of our... In a different program? And yeah. We can do whatever you want. No, I think if you would like to do it, we can do it. So it's a long lecture. I'd rather be, everybody be fresh for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you want to you delay it? Sure. The, 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 <laughs> yes, he wants to do it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Short answer is yes. No, you don't understand, Doc. <laughs> Okay, you know Thank you. He's you, trying to be nice. Yeah, I want you to say it on camera. May we please delay this for another program? Absolutely. I mean, really, because I want to ask a few questions of uh, some of you. We can that. do that. Yeah. We can, we yes, I will do that. We'll have to reschedule, but only if everybody that's currently here agrees to come back for it. Absolutely. The yes. only way I'll do it. <laughs> I'll right. On the same committee. Room. committee. Yeah. I'll so have you bring your wife and kids next time. I'm bringing the family. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll have more info, and I'm definitely I would love to come. And if you are interested in it, show what our CT findings were and what what the pathological findings. Were. Absolutely. So I'd like to do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do it because I really, I mean, I really wrap next, up with some can questions. Can it be in the, can be can it be within the next four weeks? <laughs> we'll have to look, at it. <laughs> look at our schedule. Depending on when it is, Joe. Can yes. It, okay. So if y'all will just let me know. What the, if you give me some dates, it's going to work. It could be the weekend, it could be a Saturday, it could be a Sunday, it could be a Monday, I'm ready it could to be a Wednesday. I'm ready to defer to Jatola. I'm, I'm sorry? 
When the virus soma, he is busier than me. So. Okay, so you tell me when it can happen. So okay. John, I know you have to travel. So, so you know, if you guys can just share with me that, we'll make it happen. Absolutely. Okay. I'll let you know. So, doc, just, just for the record, Dr. Samir has asked. So, the sign me, that, the sign that, what is wrong with it? Send away so we no. could please put off his COVID-19 update, which is a little long of a lecture, he says. And we'll have more updates by next time, I'm yeah. sure. And FDA, we'll have more updates. And my hero, at the Fauci, will get more stuff. And everyone here, Dr. Soma, Serena, uh, John, and Gil have all agreed to come back within somewhere within the next four to six weeks. Six weeks being the maximum. We're going to pick some time. Dr. Soma will let us know when he can do it. So we will see you then for that special program that we'll add. Check out our site. We have new programs scheduled already. And we may even take one of those and change it for this. It's just really going to depend. But it's been a pleasure to be with all of you. Again, um, yes. And what, what, what's the problem? Okay. Um, uh, they, they always do that. Can I ask like, a question on, on air? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Dr. Has, Samir has more questions to ask. Forget <laughs> me. Can you promise to have a lecture for the TMC uh, about the love because not the COVID-19? Absolutely. I, I would we, love we to. have to invite us. That is something we really have to invite us. Absolutely. I would love yeah. to. It's a, it's a really a subject that not many people are aware of. Yeah. And, you know, I stuck Serena with it because I know she's very smart and she can handle it. Thanks. So I really, we opened the subject and we want to know about the board because there's a lot of uh, medical legal issues and that. Uh, and uh, can you include in that DCD lung transplant? Absolutely. I mean, because that's your hot topic right there. That's right. And uh, should we give that, uh, should we treat that the DCD livers or not? So really, it's a very important thing. Okay? Yeah. Sure. Dr. Smear, may, may I give a closing remark now? <laughs> Just check. You know, I'm going to have one last thing. <laughs> since he that. Yeah. I really want to thank uh, Gil for supporting the <laughs> Equity Periphery Program and helping me a lot. Yes, well, thank I was going to thank Gil as well. In fact, on behalf of all of you out there and myself and the crew here, David and Magic, and everybody that's out there right now, I wanted to thank Gil, John, Dr. Smear, Dr. Soma, Serena for being here and doing this absolutely incredibly uh informative and knowledgeable people. I, I just am, I'm, I certainly am very humbled and privileged to be around all of you folks and appreciate you taking your Saturday to come here and do this. And I thank all of you for watching the program. And uh, before I go, Dr. Samir, any final thoughts? Would sure. you like to tell everybody goodbye? Goodbye. I just want to thank everybody who's really helped us through this very difficult time. I really appreciate it. Please stay safe. And please be, and I think everybody's smart enough to know there's a pandemic coming. So please, flu vaccine. I don't want to see you put you on echo because you have flu on COVID. Please don't let that happen. That's good, a good thought. Thank you all very much. Peace out. Mix cannulae. Expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual-stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal.
A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary as we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedures. So it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we're about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today.